I think like hacking small businesses is super fun. Like it's the every high schooler's dream is like hack their high school and like change their grades, we whatever. Do not endorse this <laughs> or, like, people know. You know. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> that's so true <laughs> but like uh i totally didn't yeah. do that when i was in high school <laughs> yeah to not endorse the behavior good quality stuff but like the reason i think people want to hack their high school is because like you can be the person like sitting in the classroom and maybe the alarm bell goes off and you're you're kind of like sitting there smug like i did that and nobody knows right? <laughs> Hey everyone, we've all heard of Project Discovery, right? The authors of Nuclei, HTTPX, and countless other essential security tools. What you may not have heard of, however, is their conference, Hardly Strictly Security Conference. This conference is happening April 25th from 8 a.m. onward virtually, and it's featuring the topic of everything open source security tooling. They'll have speakers from top companies like Vercel, Datadog, Hashcorp, and Fastly, and it's oriented towards anybody who cares about open source security tooling, whether you're a bug hunter, a red teamer, security leader, whoever. Uh, there should be great content for you at this conference. So if you're interested, head over to nux.gg slash hss24 slash hss24, right? Uh, hardly strictly security and then 2024 uh, to sign up and register and get in on that conference goodness. All right, with that, back to the show. All righty, Mr. Sam Curry, we have been prepping and we have so many stories in the, in the queue here. Welcome to the podcast, man. Hello, hello. Yeah, thank you for having me. Man. This is exciting. Um, Sam, you, you are just kind of like a legendary bug bounty storyteller. So I'm, I'm anticipating this podcast being largely me saying, all right, Sam, tell us about the time you got arrested at the airport or tell us about the time you broke every car in existence. Um, and, then, and then sort of hearing those stories and then picking apart some technical details. I think that's how we're going to go today. But Let's uh, let's start with a story that is not super technical. Tell tell us about the time you got you got detained at the airport. Yeah, sure. So I was just finishing up a trip from like uh, U.S. to Japan. I was flying back from Japan and to like Washington Dulles Airport. So as I get to the airport, like I'm exhausted, 15 hour flight. I'm going through the line, like normal check in, you know, immigration's process. But at the very end of the line, they like pull me aside for secondary. They're like, hey, you know. We just need to talk to you, ask a couple questions. And I haven't traveled like too much internationally at that point. So I was like, you know, it's a normal thing, whatever, we'll go. And I realized I'm like the only person in the secondary inspection. And the cop who walks me over there is like super nice. It's, the process is just super, very easy. And they're being super nice to me. We're unloading all my luggage and going through everything. They're asking about my trip. I'm explaining everything about my trip. And then finally, they ask me for my device. They say like, hey, can we just see your phone and can you unlock it? And, you know, it's part of a normal immigration process they asked for that i didn't really think anything of it so i gave the agent my unlocked phone and then afterwards they, i did that they're like okay cool now just come over into this room there's some people who want to talk to you oh and at that point gosh. like kind of alarm bells <laughs> yeah and it turns out that there was a irs ci which is like their criminal investigation and a department of homeland security officer in the room and they're both sitting across from me and they said like hey you know sam you work here here's this so and I kind of was like, they they had like knew that you were flying back into the country, and they're like, all right, we're going to snag them at the border. Yeah, it was wow, really dude. interesting because everything was planned and like coordinated before too. Like they had gone when we arrived in Japan, everybody in our group had like these little bag notices, and I'd never seen them before. I've seen like the normal TSA inspection mm -hmm. things, but these were like different notices, and I was like, oh, I guess they changed the thing. But when I went back and they pulled me into that room, what I realized is that. I was under suspicion for like wire fraud oh and gosh. I was being summoned to a grand jury in New York. Yeah. So I immediately asked them, I said like, Hey, like, can I have my device back? Because I didn't realize this was like a, you know, targeted yeah. thing. And they say like, no, we're actually allowed to keep that because it's a like normal immigrations process. So at that point, that's like I just have to sit there. Heck. It's super tricky too, because even if you're like the most clear conscious yeah. person in the world or clear conscience, yeah. sorry, your friend could have said something that's like, yeah. you know, incriminating. What they'll do is like parallel investigations. So like, even though it was just me under suspicion and it was like a weird narrative um, and I felt fine about it, it's still like a tricky thing where it's like, 
something on your phone is incriminating. Saying, what did you right? do? What, what, why, why, why were they pulling you over at the border? Yeah, so what turned out happening, um, immediately after that, they let me you know, have my device back and stuff, and they let me through. I contacted my work, and my work lawyers got involved. Um, the company I work for is like a Yuga Labs, which is like a cryptocurrency company. And what ended up happening is through my security work at Yuga Labs, where we were investigating like a phishing mm-hmm. website, I had found a scammer's private key leaked in the JavaScript file. And I'd taken that scammer's private key, and I'd plugged it into my MetaMask to see, like, are there any recoverable funds? And by doing that, they thought that I was the, oh, the scammer. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. It was really tricky, too, because it allowed them to do a full subpoena by network. So, for instance, they had, you know, my ISP logs, like in Are a you paper thing. Me? Oh, my god. Yeah, they, they read my name, like, or my, they read my mom's name because my internet was, like, still in her name. So, the whole thing was, like, very, yeah, you, you feel like you're, you know, you've, like, killed somebody or something, but... It, it really like shows you how the sausage is made too, because now you you like you have some insight into what lengths they can go to and what information they can get about you, just like without you even knowing, right? Like you, the first that you're hearing of it, they're sitting down with like a stack of paper, like, "Hey, here's everything you've been doing for the last few months," and you're like, "Oh, <laughs> cool, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what have I been doing for the last couple months?" So, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, it's very. It it feels. It's one of those things you read about. Like, I've always had the stance that, like, I'll never be important enough for them yeah. to, like, look at my thing. But then you realize it could happen to anybody. Wow, dude. So. That's crazy. And just yeah. to think that, like, how much of the coordinated effort had to happen, too. Because they're, like, you know, they were definitely contacting or contacting uh, TSA and saying, like, okay, here's this guy's picture. He's coming in on this flight. Like, we need you to snag him. And we need you to get his phone. And then, and, like, shove him in this room. And it's, like... Yeah. Oh my gosh. And like people are, are going there and it's like, Oh man. Yeah. I do wonder if it was cause it was international and like they had your passport number, but like they knew it was you, not just some other like Sam yeah, Curry. Sure. And like, that's why they knew for sure. Like, okay, let's, let's take a look on the way in and the, on the way out. Yeah. Oh yeah. hundred percent. So I guess, this this is a good transition into a different topic, which is a topic that you and I have debated many many times. Uh, it which is Sam, you do some, you know, I, for those of you that are listening on the actual audio medium of this podcast, I'm shaking my hand in like kind of like a uh, iffy sort of way. You do some some borderline things, you know, um, and you don't really do it for the bounties. Um, and this is a bug bounty podcast, so we normally talk about bug bounty, but I'm kind of wondering what your motivation is behind all this and why you're doing that. <laughs> yeah, sure. And for, for those of you who are listening who Justin just made it seem like I'm, you know, killed somebody or something. No. Uh, to clarify a little bit, <laughs> no, no, yeah. the, uh, <laughs> the, the hacking, the uh, sort of, I think what Justin's talking about is like uh, a lot of the hacking I do is like, not necessarily in bounty mm. programs and it's not necessarily scoped in like a specific like targeted way where it's like, you know, they're inviting you to come look at their stuff, right? I like a lot of the hacking I do and, and the, when I originally got into like web security and hacking, it was a lot of like really like fun kind of curiosity, right? Um, so a lot of the research we've been doing like recently um, to, to, to kind of give context to that topic, when I started Bug Bounty like eight years ago, right, I was like fresh out of high school and I really wanted to make as much money as I could, <laughs> right? You know, I grew up like super, like I'm really hungry for, for money, right? So I'm like, hell yeah, like $500 bounty there, $1,000 bounty there. And it's just like feeding, like it's going perfect, right? And I did that for a while and I got a job in security and I'm like, you know, the amounts keep getting higher and like it doesn't like hit the mm. same way. And then eventually I kind of realized like, you know, like I was... I'm not a really huge spender. I'm very comfortable. Like I think in terms of like my, I, I think like, I guess I'm trying to find a good way to describe is, it, but, but I think what yeah, I'm trying I, to say, I know that this is oh, more sorry, of a, you know, this is, this strays a little bit more into life philosophy as well, because it's like, sure. you know, it's about this interest that you have now and less about this financial motivation that you had in the beginning. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Not to, to kind of wrap it yeah. down a little bit. The, the hacking we do that we've done recently is like you have a smaller group of people that I've been working with, like Shabam Shah, like Ian Carroll. And I think like as a group, we kind of have like this love for life for like mm. hacking stuff. Like it's, it's this deep, like childlike curiosity of like seeing something and like, again, like the example of like a subway card, you're like, 
I don't want to pay for the subway. Can I get a million dollar oh subway card to like go, <laughs> you know, things like that. And like, we do it in good faith. Yeah. And that, that's when people say like, I'm, you know, doing a gray mm-hmm. line or a gray area where maybe they're not explicitly inviting us to hack them, but you know, I report them through a security program or security team. The reason I've been able to do that so successfully for like so long where it's like, I'm not getting in trouble and I'm like helping these organizations is because I think I have like very, very good intent. Yeah. Like never once have I wanted to exploit something like maliciously. It's always been kind of like found it. It's hilarious. We had a really good time. It's a good story, but it's fixed now and mm-hmm. that's good. Yeah. Right. So to talk about like that hacking, like I've kind of fallen. That's, that's how I originally got in security. And that's kind of how I like keep my flame lit, yeah. right? Is like it's that sort of interest sort of, based hacking rather than like, you know, money oriented or, or even, you know, and, and, and I guess some of this has to do with, you know, these are good stories as well. And it, and it's, it's fun story to tell and to share that, that light, that, uh, that invigoration, that passion for hacking with others. Um, and, and so the, I guess the reason you're doing this is just because of that, that curiosity. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, like nowadays it's kind of like, uh, it blends a little bit more into the normal job mm. space where security is like a normal job that people do. And like, it's a normal, easy thing that you can kind of get into as a career. But like before, even like, you know, seven or eight years ago, it was a lot blurrier where like hackers, like the whole thing, like every hacker I knew was very like culture oriented where they just have like this love for hacking, love for security. They have this ecosystem and it's like this, you know, like the, the introduction song to this podcast, like Whitey Cracker, like as a kid, like I grew up listening to Whitey, I'm 13 years old, 14 years old. And I'm like, you know, he's like deep in the matrix. It's crazy. Like that world is just like exciting. Right. And I like, as I grew up, that's like my, I still have that world, right? Like it's three in the morning. I'm like deep in something like there's like that really, really deep passion where it's like, you want to do it because you love it. Right. That's, that's cool. Sam. I have to say, you know, a lot of, a lot of people in this industry are green hats, you know, to reference back to YT, um, and, and looking for the money in it. Uh, And, and I mean, I'll, I'll say, you know, I do bug bounty full time and I'm not financially independent yet. So, uh, I, I definitely, that is definitely a motivation for me, but it's definitely cool to see someone a little bit more motivated by the passion for the, the, and, and letting that be the leading factor, right? Like I, I think for me, it's more of like, I look at a target that I, that I, that has good bounties on it. And then, you know, my passion for hacking comes out against that target because I, I love the day to day and I love getting in the weeds with it. And I love reading the JavaScript files and figuring out how stuff's working, but it's still pointed at the top level by that, um, you know, financial incentive. Um, and then also for me by the safe Harbor incentive as well, which doesn't seem to be as big of a, a thing for you. Like, and, and, and we've, we've debated this, you know, um, to the end of the, that we can debate this in, in our little group chats or whatever, but, um, talk to me a little bit about why you feel, why you feel safe hacking all of these targets and, and yeah, let's start there. Yeah. I think it's maybe the safety is kind of a, I I think there is a lack, there's a small lack of safety where as I get older and I think I'm mature and I kind of settle into like this lifestyle of like less Mm -hmm. risk that I'm kind of like slowly like concising down. But like, for me, I see like hacking, you know, if there's a company that doesn't have a security program, for instance, we looked at casinos recently. I'll, I'll give you an example where it was a really bad interaction. So we were investigating like online gambling and online casinos. We found this one online casino and there was a specific game in the casino where you're able to replay the request and generate like an unlimited balance. <laughs> and we were like, this is hilarious. We didn't try to withdraw it or anything. We just reported it immediately. We're like, hey guys, like we found this How bug. How many times did you do it, Sam? And what? <laughs> well, I think I end up with a balance of I end up with a balance of three million dollars in my account, right? A little excessive. However, what ended up happening that I didn't realize is that the game providers on the online casinos, like let's say you're a slot mm. company and you make the slot, they're like a sub company that sells the slot machine to the gambling oh, website. Interesting. Okay. And what ended up happening? Yeah, they the the gambling website saw the slot machine had generated three million dollars and they just cut them off completely. And they said we don't want to do business with you anymore because of this vulnerability. So I got on the phone with this guy in the UK who runs the slot company. And I'm like, Hey, I just want to report this vulnerability. And he says, so you're the guy who's committing fraud on, on our slot Uh-oh. machine. And I'm like, so yeah, at that point it's like, you know, everything in your head's like, this wasn't my intent, blah, blah, right. blah. 
but they could still see you financially. And it's like a tricky situation that you have to navigate, right? And of course, the complexities of like UK law versus US and like whether or not you have permission, like it's very complicated, but like I think the leading thing is like good intent, mm. but it can, in this case, like stray because it does. So you and can't leave cause, us there, like, Sam. What, what happened, dude? How did you weasel your way out of this one? Yeah, so <laughs> I weaseled my, my way out by, I we had like a continued effort to like report, we reported the bug, we worked on the fix. I communicated with the casino. I mm. said, hey, I'm a researcher who found this. We've talked to the company and we kind of meshed it together and things were like good. Mm. And I'm sure but, you can, uh, I'm sure it was, you can convey to that company as well. Like, hey, you know, the companies that are having their, their products assessed are the ones you want to work with, not the ones that you don't want to work with, right? Because the ones that don't have their product assessed, the bugs are just sitting there waiting for, it, you know, a malicious hacker to hack them. I, yeah, exactly, right? Like, would you rather have, like, one example where someone, you know, it's $3 million, but it's never exploited, or, like, thousands of users that are just adding in $100, $200, right. and then slowly withdrawing money? It's a really interesting conversation. Um, I, I did a training one time. I was... I worked for a consultancy and during the training, at the end of the training, we, my people who I was working with, the web application security training we did, he said, let's just like go to this uh, website here to kind of assess the, you know, like look at the security of it. And it wasn't like a full like test where he was like sending malicious traffic, but someone in the audience was like, hey, you aren't really allowed to test uh, random websites, right? And then he responds, well, it's like, it's like it's a personal risk thing where it's like if you're not doing enough damage or not causing enough noise like are you going to get sued probably not but it's kind of like your risk mm. profile right yeah um, i mean is there especially for you now established at you know very publicly as a you know white hat ethical security researcher I bet that risk is is probably minimized even more for you than somebody who doesn't have a track record of ethical security research because of the caveats in the you know computer fraud and abuse act specifically for good faith security research. Yeah, it it, remind, it reminds me of a skit actually. There's a TV show called Nathan for You, and in the show he says, uh, he's like, "Hey, I want to do this like big public thing." Great that, show. It's a great show. It's fantastic. Um, he says like, Hey, I want to do this thing, which is like totally a joke. I want to make this parody restaurant. Yeah. And then he talks to the lawyer and he's like, to make this parody restaurant, what do I have to do? And the lawyer says, you need to establish yourself as like a, a comedian or a guy who does like pranks. So he quickly goes and does like a performance art thing and tries to build a name for himself. Right. But I think as a security researcher, like you can Google mm -hmm. Sam Curry and it comes up with like the past work. It's a legitimate mm -hmm. person. Right. Versus a lot of people I see who try to reach out over email they'll use their alias and it's like hacker 447 yeah. <laughs> and they're like, I'm not going to give you my real name. But here's, and it's like, I, I get it. Yeah. And I'm, you know, being anonymous, whatever, it's great. But like you do come off a little more malicious like that. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I think there's definitely something mm. to be said for that established track record. Yeah. Mm. So, so when you're picking targets, um, I know like a lot of it is sort of just like the interest though, like the love for hacking. Um, do you ever sort of like choose not to hack things or to go after certain things? Like I think, there's lots of different levels that you can hack stuff at, right? So like you can go like to the smallest level where it's like an individual like using a specific instance of a product or you can like go to like the product itself or like the parent company who owns that product or like, you know, you can sort of step up the chain to like larger and larger scopes. Um, where do you like to draw that line? Because I know a lot of people like we have mutual friends who really love hacking small local businesses and it's just like they feel you know they get a really large amount of impact out of that they feel you know like that they're creating a lot of good in their community like they have these really great relationships with the small businesses and stuff um but i would say you probably aren't hacking mostly small businesses so you're you're hacking mostly large businesses so what where what sort of draws you in that direction versus the, like the small business route yeah so i think like picking targets is really fun because like Mostly what, I, what I've been looking for recently is like choke points where it's like, for instance, like a single point of failure that has like this cascading effect where it's just like millions of people, right? I think like hacking small businesses is super fun. Like it's the, every high schooler's dream is to like hack their high school and like change their grades, whatever. Not endorse this <laughs> or like people know. You know. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> but like, uh, I totally didn't yeah. do that when I was in high school. <laughs> yeah. You know, to not endorse the behavior, good quality stuff. But like, the reason I think people want to hack their high school is because like you can be the person like sitting in the classroom and maybe the alarm bell goes off and you're, you're kind of like sitting there smug. Like I did that and nobody knows. Right. <laughs> so there's like this, there's this like kind of, you can kind of do that with like small businesses or 
bigger things. Like I tend to focus on like big points of failure, like interesting things to me. So for instance, the research we did with like uh, Nico uh, Spectres with like car security stuff, where it's like something I didn't know up until like a few months ago is that you can scan a license plate and it'll give you the VIN number of the car, right? And basically what that means is for every car in the United States, wait, 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 you go from... To, I'm going I'm to pause sorry, you sorry, there. How did to, you... How? Did you, how? Oh, yeah. So it's public. You can pay for an API that will basically no way, do this. Really? Because, the, the, yeah, the DMV will sell these records to these like small companies or these like contractors that provide them to like maybe you're a traffic endorsement camera company okay. or something. Yeah, so for about like, you know, one and a half cents per API call, you can resolve someone's license plate to the red number, right? So if you think about it, like if if I want to have fun, like hacking stuff, and it's like an interesting thing, and I'm not, these companies do have safe harbors, a lot of them. It's like hilarious to me, like being in line at Starbucks and like the idea, just the idea of it, not actually doing it, but scanning someone's license plate and making their car honk. Like it's just hilarious because it's like really fun, Dude. right? And that's kind of how the person in front of you, you know, you see them pull pull up a little bit before you on the way in, you know, they're ahead of you, they're walking through the door, you just take a quick picture of their license plate. (laughs) When they get in line in front of you, make the alarm go off, they leave line and you just keep going ahead. (laughs) Sam, this is so cool, man. (laughs) It's a little yeah, I mean like Uh, there's there's kind of I have to say it it really is like uh, something I describe it right is like as an ethical hacker, you do have to kind of like put away the idea of like, you're never actually going to exploit it, right? And mm-hmm. like your intent is always good. But like to exchange that, like I think you do kind of have to like enjoy getting to that yeah. point and like kind of dwell on that just a tiny bit. Like um, what I'm trying to say is that like, since you never actually cross that line, I think you kind of have to extract as much fun as possible mm-hmm. from like dancing around it a little bit, yeah. if that makes sense. Well, it, it, it's very interesting too, because the attack things, the attack scenarios that you're, the attack things, the attack scenario that you're going <laughs> after is really, they're what, if I were a malicious hacker, this is what I would want to do. You know, I would want the power yeah. to make somebody's alarm go off in their car, you know, in my Starbucks line. And I would want the power to, you know, unlock locks at a, a you know, hotel or something like that. And, and yeah. so all of these targets that you're going after are very like tangible black hat stuff. Whereas, you know, like yeah, exactly. my little C surf or whatever that I submitted to this, to this company is not something that most black hats are like, you know, chomping at the bit to, to find. Yeah, sure. I, it, there is that big difference, right? Where like, I think finding the sea surf can be just as fun and like getting mm. paid for it. It's like still, it's still val- really valuable to the mm. team. But like, you know, as like an individual, like let's say you're a homeowner and you have a security system, you kind of want to have a clear conscience that like nobody's like looking at you through your yeah. camera, right? So maybe it's a fun thing to do is like hack your home security system, right? Um, there's a good, there's a guy named Net Spooky who's one of the most talented, great dude, like low level engineer people. It's just fantastic, like genuinely great. But I was having a conversation one day and he told me something that I didn't know. I'd never really thought about it. He's like, he's like, you know, you can like change your world. Like if you see something in the world that like you don't like, or it's like you have impact on the world and like you can affect things. Like it's a really low level point. That's very cliche, but like very deep, you know, but he, he's like, you know, like if you don't like something in the world, you can change it. So like the idea of like, you know, I, I'm curious about the security of iPhones because I don't want to get like my iPhone hacked or whatever. So it's like research iPhone mm. security and then maybe you find something. But clearly so. this isn't coming from a place of privacy concerns for you because, you know, you're a pretty public figure. Yeah. I I think it's like a, a lot of it. So like very like straightforward. Uh, there's like, I kind of dwell on I think that chaos and the fun and like the kind of the pandemonium of like creating like situations, mm. right? Where, it, it obviously you get kind of a rush from like, oh, a journalist did a story about sure, a bug you found. Sure. And like, you know, there's people talking about like this. For instance, uh, recently there was a vulnerability. It was a huge effort by Ian Carroll and Leonard Wouters and they're most like talented hardware people. But like they found this vulnerability where you could unlock any hotel room, right? Or from a company called Safflock, uh, whose parent company is Dorman Kaba. But to talk about that, it's kind of funny because it's like... Uh, you know, every American's like nightmare for 
nighttime television is like someone's getting in my hotel room. So it's hilarious to see like, oh, CBS did a story about this bug and like, you know, you're the person who helped with it. So it's that is just that fun. is really cool. I have to say that is pretty rad. And 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 I, just jumping back to the the online casino thing as well, this has been a pretty good entrance for you to do like pen testing or security consulting for these companies as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's a really good like it's a sales it's a salesperson's kind of like mm-hmm. dream, right? Like if I wanted to sell a product to a company, say like a pen mm-hmm. test or something. When you report a vulnerability, you're immediately providing value to mm-hmm. this company, right? So you say, hey, I found this bug. Here, here's what it is. Here's how you can fix it. And they say, thanks. You know, great mm-hmm. to meet you. You provided value, right? So you have this good relationship with this random company. It, it's a really good, like, pipeline if you did want to sell pen tests, right? Which is, like, kind of an interesting thing because it, it there's a topic I've been really, like, always curious about where it's, like... Um, Inadvertently, I think I end up in a lot of situations where I'll report a, co- a vulnerability to a company, and they'll offer me money like not to disclose it, mm, right? That's sketchy. And even though I never, have, it's very sketchy because it's like I never asked this company for money. I never wanted to like extract money from this company, but I plan on like blogging about it. And they're saying like, hey, you know, maybe you don't blog about this, and maybe we give you like five grand or something. Yeah. And it's like to accept that feels it. Yeah, exactly. Like it feels like so. So, like, I think there's a lot of situations that I think is a really interesting topic of, like, you know, maybe you claim you're, like, a good faith researcher, but you're hacking all these companies, and then you, like, publicly humiliate the companies, and it builds up your reputation. Um, yeah. I think that's, like, it, yeah, it's a tricky kind of yeah. world. No, it, it is for sure. And and there's definitely a lot of positive attributes to public disclosure. Um, but it does, it does... I mean, I could understand the company's position as well in that scenario of like, yeah, we really don't want this coming out under our name. Um, but it also makes that that sort of, it, it helps shift the culture a little bit more towards something that, that makes security look like a good thing rather than a bad thing, which I think is good. You know, So if at the end of the day, a company comes yeah. out and says, hey, we were hacked by an ethical hacker. Here's how we dealt with it. Here's the disclosure process, that sort of thing. At the end of the day, if they have a good PR team, that should be spun positively. You know, We, we were agree. able to secure our devices you know, in this specific scenario or something like that. And I think what most people just don't understand about that is that Every company has security vulnerabilities. So the fact that somebody's fixing a security vulnerability doesn't mean that it's bad that they had a security vulnerability in the first place. It means that there's one less of them, you know? So it, it, I, I guess yeah. I'm sure you have to do some coaching with these companies too on how exactly to portray that to the to the public. Yeah, it, it's, it's super funny because like I think a good parallel there is like the power of marketing to make a company look so big and so secure mm-hmm. Like the the mythos of like Apple, you know, you now have this great big company of Apple, but like, then you have this security researcher who's able to like hack Apple and it like, instead of, you know, hey, maybe Apple as a company is like any other company and it has security vulnerabilities, the media story then becomes like, oh, this hacker is just so smart that they've hacked Apple. But it's like, well, no, like, it's just any other company, right? Like, if that makes sense, basically what I'm trying to say is like, it does, you know, like, the, yeah. So... Do you find that a lot of companies are like, is, is there any correlation between like size or revenue or anything with like how good their security is? Or is it pretty much because I noticed like when you're picking targets, you really don't like it never even seems to cross your mind like, oh, this might be difficult to hack. You're kind of just like, I want to do this thing on the like, I want to mm-hmm. honk the horn, right? <laughs> Whatever it yeah. is. And then you're just like fixated on that and figuring out how to get there it doesn't really matter like what the company is or what their infrastructure is it's really just like a one step towards the goal um does it ever like get in your head like oh man this company is like so secure i don't think i'm gonna be able to hack it or like anything like that yeah sometimes uh to give an example there's like a funny enough i was going through like the san francisco airport and there was a coffee machine that had like a robot arm and it was like a scan on your phone to order a coffee and the robot will make it for you and i was like that's hilarious right and it turns out that they deployed this machine inside like Tesla. Like, so Tesla has one inside their office and it's remotely connected to the internet and you can push commands to it through some website, right? And I tried super hard to hack this like coffee robot and it couldn't find a single vulnerability. But then like as we're going along the airport, I see like, you know, Delta or like an airline. And no sooner did I find like a critical vulnerability in like an actual airline than like a yeah, coffee company, yeah. right? And it's like, 
how do you tell like what's secure, what's not? It's really impossible, mm. right? Yeah, mm-hmm. I, 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 mm. I've, I've thought a little bit about that. Yeah. I was about to ask the same question, Joel. And, and it's like one of the things that I do like about Bug Bounty in particular, though, is that you do get some of the more hardened AppSec targets, right? Um, most of the, 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 the very hardened AppSec targets are going to have a bug bounty program because otherwise, how are you, how are you, you know, getting this hardened, I'd imagine. Um, and, and so where does, that, where does the actual technical challenge come in for you versus like these goals that you set up for like what you want to accomplish? Yeah, so I think that the technical challenge comes in when like, the technical challenge for me and like where I really delve into the world of like the technical challenge is like if I have a goal and I can't quite seem to get to the goal and I have to accomplish some hurdle to get there. Um, sometimes it's like I'll discover some new attack method or I'll find like some interesting research because I want some, you know, end goal. Um, but other times it's like very simple where there's like no research involved. Everything is very simple. So for instance, right, like one of the car vulnerabilities we found was like a company called Spirion and there's millions of connected devices that are behind this admin panel. And to get access to every single one of the devices, it was literally just SQL injection, like admin, quote, space, pound, dash, dash, no. or whatever. And then you're in. Yeah, and it's like, you feel like, w- one thing that's kind of frustrating for me is like, uh, I've done like, a, we've, we've, we've done like a lot of really cool blog mm. posts, right? Where it's cool research, it's interesting. And then like, maybe I wanted to like blog about like car scooter or something, but like, to actually get there, like the actual method is like very simple and you kind of feel like you're cheating people a little bit. You're like, here's how we did this big thing. And it's very yeah. simple. And you're like, well, yeah. Yeah. And like, you do wish it's, I, I know exactly what you mean. Cause you do wish it's like more of a challenge. Like some of these things are like, oh, this is going to be so hard. Like I'm going to have to go through all these layers of security and all these things. And it's literally just like one unauthenticated endpoint. And you're like, oh, that was really, I mean like, yeah, that's bad, but like, that's yeah. so lame. Like, yeah. I, just, I wish it was more, more fun than that to have to get to here. Exactly. Yeah. There's like no story to it. It just feels kind of like you're cheaping it out a little bit, but yeah, that's kind of a thriving in that technicality bit. But that's the scary um, bit though, too, is like you have these goals, very realistic goals, very black hat goals, right? That you, that you would like, that any black hat would like to have. And then they're like textbook sql ingestion (laughs) and it's like oh no (laughs) so uh you know on one hand it makes for less of an of a technically interesting story for us that are you know often in the weeds and hacking stuff that's really hardened and go in there and figure out okay you know it's just like a textbook sql injection but um from the story perspective, it actually even makes it a little scarier because it's like, oh, this was a textbook SQL injection. Somebody, you know, two months into their hacking journey could have found this. And it it does make you understand, like, because we we know the vast amount of people that have, there's a very big difference between the really, really pro security researchers and the amount of people that get far enough to do a textbook SQL injection, right? Like there, there's a way bigger group yeah. of people that can do that. So th- there's, by extension, there's a way bigger group of people that could do this from a black hat perspective. Um, so it's definitely, it's definitely a little bit, a little bit scary to see that sort of thing. Um, I, I, I yeah. want to take, uh, take a turn here and, and talk about this. Don't force yourself to become a bug bounty hunter blog that you put out. I don't even know what, when, this is probably like what, five years ago, maybe. Um, uh, but this is a very interesting blog. Yeah. Four years ago, very interesting blog, because essentially this is something that you and I kind of <laughs> discuss uh, on a regular basis, uh, just because our personality types are very different in how we approach things. And, um, essentially what you, what you talked about in this blog was this whole concept of like, trying to foster the passion for bug bounty um, versus forcing yourself to be able to do bug bounty. Um, and I think you can kind of see this come through in your, in your hacking as well, because you're, you're spending your time focusing and hacking on things that you're passionate about. And when you became less passionate about making money, <laughs> uh, you, you know, your, your focus shift from bug bounty to this, this more, I don't know, mercenary hacking or whatever you want to call this thing. Right. Um, <laughs> And, and, and so, I, I, like, what, what what advice do you have for people that are getting into bug bounty and are uh, putting themselves through the challenge of listening to this uh, podcast um, <laughs> in, in fostering that passion and using that as a motivator for their bug bounty experience? Yeah, so to talk about that blog a little bit and kind of just, like, the advice is, like, 
when I wrote that blog, it was at a time where like a lot of people were reaching out to me like, hey, I really want to get in security. Can you give me tips? Can you mentor me? Can you give me these examples? Like, how do I get started? What do I read? What do I do? And like, you have like kind of this textbook person who they're sitting at their desk, it's five o'clock, they just got home from work or school or whatever. And they're really stressed out because they want to, you know, they see these people like finding bugs and like, how do I get there? And they're trying to read through and like flip through these books. And maybe it's not working super well where they feel like you've, you're kind of in this mindset where you feel like you've got this end goal and you have to like really grind to get there. Maybe some like, there's something in your ethos where it's like, I need to be like military about my study and like my work routine and like commit to get there. But when I write about like, hey, it's like, don't force yourself to be a bug bounty hunter. It's kind of a a preach to people, I think, like with the same mentality as me. There are people, um, for instance, Peter, Pete Yorsky, who I worked at Shopify. I don't know if he's still there, but when he got into bug bounty, he was someone who I think was able to do it really, really like military kind of style where he got himself started really quickly, did courses, did trainings, and it worked super well. Like Pete became one of the smartest people like in bug bounty and like in security that I knew. And he did it through like this kind of military training where it was just like a lot of like intensity. Um, but me on the other hand, it was never like that. Right. So when people came to me and were like, how do I like grind? Like you grinded, you know, like you have this work ethic. It's like, well, no, I don't like what, what I did to get to like bug bounty is like, I kind of just like, instead of like trying to pick the books to read, you know, I was playing video games and I like wanted to get rich in the video game. And like, that's, you know, like fostering that like flame for me was like so much better. Right. Um, and it depends like per personality. Um, I'm not, no, I'm not comparing anybody in bug bounty whatsoever to like Magnus Carlson, but there's a really funny thing in the chess documentary about like Mag- the world's greatest chess player, like total genius, like fantastic guy. But when he got into chess, like, his parents realized he loved chess and they immediately got in this coach and the coach guy, the first one was like, you need to read these books and do this. And it didn't work out. Like he immediately became, you know, but the second coach he got, he looks at Max Carlson and he's like, let's just step away from it and like, let him play chess and like have a good time with it. So like, he's reading like, you know, like uh, Donald Duck novels and playing chess at the same time. And it's like, he, he becomes like the greatest like chess player of all time. Right. Where someone else, like, um, there are other, there are other chess players, uh, who are like world champions here who have like different regiments, right? Maybe they're born into, you know, very routine oriented, like normal stuff. Um, but I guess what I was trying to get from the blog post is basically like, if you feel like it's not working well and you feel like there's all this pressure, I've never once found a bug like in that pressure. I've always like, when I find good bugs, it's like relaxed and good. Yeah. yeah. So maybe don't force wow. yourself. Yeah, so. no, that's, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead, Joel. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, like, I've definitely felt a lot of this as I progressed throughout my career, both through Bug Bounty and like professionally, especially with like the lack, as I've had both, there's a lack of financial dependence for me for Bug Bounty. And that's also changed my mindset on it significantly, where when I was first starting Bug Bounty, I was like, you know, a lot of other people who are just starting bug bunny, they don't have a lot of money. They're, it's like a really good way to earn money and like put your skills to use. And it's like engaging. But then it shifts, just like any other job, where it becomes work and it becomes like a thing that you feel like you start to have to do. And like, especially when they take it full time, like, you know, I, I'm sure there are some days you wake up and you don't want to hack Justin, but I, mm-hmm. you, you have to, yep. right? Like, you need to submit a bug to get, you know, some money today. Um, or in three weeks or whatever. But, you know, and so I think one of the things I really like about how you hack, Sam, is that like you, it's not like, it's almost never about the money, right? Like it's about like, oh, this seems really interesting. Like I want to just like follow this and this is so so engaging. And that's when I find, uh, just like what you said, like for me, that's how I feel engaged when I'm hacking. Like it's not when I'm stressed. It's not when I'm like, oh, I need to hack. Oh, I need to hack. I need to be doing, I like, I feel like I have to hack. No, it's, mm. I want to hack. Like, oh, that, that's really interesting. I wonder how that works. Uh, oh, that's like a super interesting thing. It's not about the bounty. It's not, oh, do they have a bounty program? It's like, oh, that would be really cool if I could do X, Y, Z. Like, I wonder if that's possible. Um, and I think like that natural curiosity is so much better of a driving factor than like yeah. chasing after money because the money will like facilitate things in life, but it's not going to really necessarily make you happy. And I, I would like to know sort of how you balance that because I know you didn't always have a full-time job. And so hacking a lot of time was a source of money for you. Did you have to do like sort of dual 
like hacking where you're like hacking for money and then also hacking for fun or like how, how did you manage that? Yeah, sure. So I can, I can actually just share like my full kind of progression, right? So like my first job, I worked at like a fast food restaurant. Um, so it was very like, at that time, it's like the end of high school. I'm like trying to balance like paying certain bills or whatever. And then I got in the bug bounty where I'm earning like, let's say like an extra like $1,500 a month. And for me, that was huge. That was enough to like quit my job. I'm still with my parents this time. And then after that, uh, I started doing like bug bounty full time where I was maybe earning, I think like in a year or two, I earned like a hundred thousand USD a year, which is great for like bug bounty. And, uh, at that point I was like really enthusiastic about it, but I wanted more stability because I felt kind of stressed. I was in college and I was like still earning money from bug bounty, but I was like, this is really unstable. What if it all falls apart? So then I got a job at hacker one where I worked as a, uh, security analyst or triager. So when I was in college, I worked as uh, doing triage for Hacker One, and I had that kind of consistent income, but I wasn't doing enough bug bounty on the side, so I was actually making, I think, less, but it was, like, stable, air quotes, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and then I transitioned... Sorry, this is, like, the no, full no, recap, but it's, I, maybe it'll help somebody. No, this is good, because okay. I think this is... I mean, I took a very similar approach. I think a lot of people do, especially when they're going back and forth between, like, full-time work and bug bounty work and, and all that, so yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, right? Yeah, like, the transition part's really good, but after kind of college, I, I did like a year of college and I stepped away. And at that point, I wanted to transition into more like a, a real security role. So I worked at a security consultancy where I was doing 40 hours of pen testing. It was like, pen, you know, pen test grind, you know, that was a, that was definitely a grind. Um, it's probably more than 40 hours, but it's very routine, like hacking the same thing. But it's very, it's good money and it's a good salary. And I didn't feel like content at that point because I felt like I was losing potential because, you know, I, there's like Tommy DeVos who's making like, you know, it's like my SSRF was like 50 K and like, geez, like what is going on? Like, uh, yeah. and that was like the, the peak of the Yahoo program. Right. And at that time with the Yahoo program, like going off, I was like, I need to step away from consulting. So I kind of like put my two weeks. I was like, Hey, I really appreciate the opportunity, but I want to do full-time bug bounty. So then I transitioned to like maybe three or four years of like full-time hard, like bug bounty, which was like, your income goes up a lot and like it's, you learn a lot, but it's really stressful. And at the end of that, um, th- at the end of that four or five years was when cryptocurrency stuff started to kind of take off. And I thought like, can I, can I pause? There were so many. Person. Oh yeah, go ahead. I'm wondering yeah, yeah. why that was stressful and what kind of, is it because the income was inconsistent or because for me, one of, one of the things that's been really interesting with full time bug bounty is you get a big, you know, windfall essentially from you know a great event or you know popping a target or whatever and then you know the next month comes around and sometimes you you still feel like oh i need to hack again to pay my bills but my bills are paid for the next year you know like so yeah so can you talk a little bit yeah. about what how that was stressful for you yeah sure i think uh one big thing for me at the time is like I think when I'm hacking or when I'm involved in something, I'm, I'm either like zero or a hundred. Right. And one thing is for me that is like, I didn't really address until like later in my life is I'm a type one diabetic. Right. I take like insulin every day for like meals and stuff. And I like neglected like caring for myself pretty much up until I was like 20, 22 or something, you know? So basically my blood sugar, it was like four times the normal level it was supposed to be from when I was like, 12 to like 20 right and that like took like yeah it was really really bad there's probably going to be some you know like i have like nerf damage and stuff and things like that but like uh when i was like doing full-time bug bounty um there were other things too that kind of came up where every morning like it was kind of funny i was thinking the other day i was like i was like am i allowed to call myself like a bug bounty person and i realized that like Pretty much every day for the last like seven years, I've consistently just like woken up, immediately gone to my computer. The whole day is at my computer doing security related stuff, like every single day. And a lot of the people, a lot of people I know are the same, right? But it didn't, it doesn't really help go towards a balanced lifestyle. Um, the, the version of me in high school, I wanted to make a ton of money. I wanted to like, you know, do these really cool things. And I really committed to that one bit, right? But now I have like a girlfriend responsibilities like duties and I'm doing full-time bug bounty and I can't like let that go where it's like very stressful because like I'm committed to like, you know, if I don't out earn myself the month before I just kind of blow up a little bit. So that's, that's a really tricky piece, right? Because it's like, why do we feel like shit if we have a downtrending month after we just had us, you know, 
you know yeah I mean, go for it Joel. Yeah. I mean, let, me hear, let me hear your opinion <laughs> it's it's because it's because your your performance is directly based on your your personal um you know like how how good did you do right did you find the bug did you did you break through the really hard wall and if you don't then you see it as a personal failure even though you're dealing in a in a world where you can be hacking on the coffee machine for three <laughs> hours and find nothing and you can hack on delta for 30 minutes and find a critical right and and, and the world's just weird and unfair like that I totally agree yeah like the the unfairness i totally agree with it's like you know you're looking for like Ideally, you know, if you like lift weight, you you slightly increase your whatever over time. It's a very consistent, good reward. But like, you know, like some people like Shubs, like one of the best hackers ever, mm. has like a blog where he's like, I wasn't able to find bugs for months and it like burned me out. But it's like people have down months, like you say, but like mentally being able to separate that is like for a lot of us it's really yeah. hard. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your mental during that time, those like th four or five years when you were doing bug bounty full time? Was it because now again, like now it seems very much like goal oriented hacking back then. Was it just money, like just focusing on paying bills and finances and all that kind of stuff and just doing hacking as a job more than anything? Or like, did you find any fun in it? Yeah, I think it was a mix of uh, like bills, but also the community at that time. That was when I was like most involved, I think, in the bug bounty community. That was like live hacking event after live hacking event. Everybody I know was doing full time bug bounty. And like my whole world was like bug bounty, right? Like everybody I kind of talked to, bug bounty, bug bounty, bug bounty. Where now it's like, you know, I have friends in security who are doing consulting or like EDR or like these things. And there's all these different worlds, right? But at that time, the only thing I cared about is like, am I going to get NBA? Like, I got to go for these awards. You know I, mean? I definitely feel that. Yeah, gotcha, no, that. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a different type of goal, you know. It, yeah, it, it definitely is. Yeah, yeah. and there, and there's a lot of aspects to it because the, and and I know for me, just sort of on the flip side, going back to the motivation conversation is like, for me, my passion. I I have a strong passion for hacking, obviously, but um, for me, I think the the dopamine payout or whatever is is oriented a little bit more towards success as a generic entity rather than hacking in general you know like like i love the process of hacking um but my payoff comes from succeeding in some way right so so that's yeah. why that's why like for bug bounty that's why i can pick a target and i can say okay my goal is to you know hack this target or whatever and and makes money or whatever and it's not and goal oriented hacking is really helpful. We've talked about that on the pod. It's it's super invigorating when you actually pop the goal of you, of what you want to do. Um, but I think for me, it's more it's more of a of a success oriented thing, and that's why I, I have a little bit more I think sustainability than most people in bug bounty um, because it's like okay, uh, let me just set set these these arbitrary little little goalposts, right? Okay. I want to get this, this extra gadget or, and, and I, we've talked about this as well. It's like, you, you gotta recognize little pieces of success on the way with hacking, because sometimes you are going to slam your head against the wall and you're not going to get anywhere. But if you, if you recognize, Oh, Hey, there's a, there's a gadget that allows me to, um, you know, do a path traversal in an OAuth flow, even though I don't know how to leak the code, I can lend it on any page in the domain. Right. Um, that gadget alone should be a little bit of a payoff for you, uh, you know, from a motivation perspective. Um, and keeping those up, I think, really, that, that's kind of where where my motivation comes from in these sort of scenarios, um, which which is which is is, yeah. is pretty different. And in the long time, bug bounty flow is 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 really tricky to stay healthy throughout that whole thing. And you mentioned, um, I think, in that blog post that we were talking about, the don't force yourself to be a bug bounty hunter. That you have, you know, dealt with burnout along the way. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, how, how you deal with that and how, because four years as, as a full-time bug bounty hunter is a, a long stint. So how did, how did you get over those yeah. and how did you return to hacking when you were kind of burnt? Yeah. yeah. And also maybe that, maybe that'll cycle back in. Cause I know we kind of paused the, you know, your, your story as you were going through sort of how you got to yeah. where you, you were. So, um, I'm also yeah. curious how that played in. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think like. Four years is a long stint for like anything, I think, too. And like one big part of that is like you're learning like the whole rest of your life. Like, you know, like I'm talking to people who are having kids or getting married, and there's like so much like you're trying to. So maybe like you've got your, I mean, it's just so much to try to process, right? But to go to the bug bounty part where it's like, 
burnout can be really tough where, I mean, some of seriously, like maybe, I think a year and a half ago, I probably had like the worst year of my life because I was removed from, I, I kind of removed myself from bug bounty. I'll talk more about that. And I didn't really have any metric to kind of feel successful or like anything to tie my success to or happiness to. And I just felt very stagnant. And the reason for Bing was uh, to, to go all the way back to the, the four years of bug bounty, it had its highs and lows, like it's roller coaster, like everything else, you know, uh, one of the events, like I ended up like working with like doggy G we got like first and second place is really, I was really happy with, um, and that's like a really high moment for me is like being able to get the awards and like going out on stage. And it's like, you've done a really good job. You feel great. But then the other months where it's like, you don't find anything it's, you know, but like dealing with that is super tricky. Um, and it's like a life thing, I think, where you're trying to learn how to deal with that. Um, but what ended up helping me was transitioning to um, starting a consultancy, which is what kind of I did after that, where instead of doing bug bounty, I wanted to get kind of more involved in the pen test world. And the, I kind of started the story a little bit, but at that time we were auditing a lot of like cryptocurrency stuff because there's all these crypto bug bounty programs. And they, we realized that they didn't really have a lot of web security. So we started doing web, web consulting for like, you know, these big exchanges like Bitfinex or Coinbase or like uh, OpenSea, things like that. Right. And we, me, Brett Bierhaus, Mike Robert, uh, we had this small team of people who built this company out over, a little bit over a year, right? And it was really, really fun where you started this big process where you've got your like statement of work, these documents, everything's signed up and you're getting clients and stuff and you have that growth, right? So it was a year of building something great and like you're really happy about it. But what ended up happening was like we, one of our, com- our customers that we worked really closely with, they actually acquired the company and we went over to work as employees. And at that point in time, like it was really great and we we're doing a lot of work, but it slowly kind of less work and less work. And, uh, I wasn't really, I was working at a private company now and there wasn't a lot of security people and the work we were doing, like, wasn't, I didn't really feel like I was like maybe doing the same level of work I was doing before. And it kind of turned into just not really having any positive feedback. Right. And that year of my life, I think was like really not knowing how to like manage that was really, really hard. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you were kind of in a bit of a flux where it's like, you know, you had just come off this sort of high intensity push for the last couple of years of just like nonstop grind. And then you suddenly fell into this very stable situation, um, but almost like too stable where it's like, oh, there's no like, where's the excitement? Like, there's nothing really like it's so day in, day out, just like come to work, leave work, come to work, leave work, like, you know and there's it's just like not very fulfilling um and is that sort of the point where you started doing the big target hacking or like were you already kind of doing a little bit of that and you were like let's get back to that yeah so i I think i was doing a little bit of that but i kind of transitioned to it a lot harder at the end of it because uh it really does suck because bug bounty specifically too is like you work you put in the hours you get a bounty like it's a very the cycle is there right but with a salary, it's just so disconnected of like, do you do extra work this month, no work this month? And it shifts a lot. Like realistically, like it's going to shift a lot, right? But you still get that consistent paycheck every month. And then your brain kind of stops. It like removes that association you had before of like time, effort, money, right? So like, so true. yeah, it really sucks. Um, and at that point, yeah, I, I kind of was like, I want to do more of what I love that has like results and stuff, right? Like, uh, Working, uh, the Shubs, I think, too, kind of felt the same way. And I had a long conversation with him about it where he has done, like, so much security work and, like, provided, like, so much value and done bug bounty so much. But, like, he, at the end of the day, he wanted to do, like, high-impact vulnerability research. So we kind of worked together on that and that changed a lot, right? Yeah, so I, I will say I noticed that you do a lot of collaboration and stuff um, with other hackers. Um oftentimes a lot of the same hackers, but what has sort of led you to like what I know a lot of this stuff, you like, well, you'll just like be in a, one of our group chats and you'll, it'll be like four in the morning and you'll just post, oh, I just found some crazy <laughs> vulnerability, like X, Y, Z. And it's just like, okay, I'm going to go to sleep now. <laughs> you're like, oh, okay. That's, that's pretty wild. Um, 
but that's not all the time. Like I know sometimes you do sort of fall off into your little hacking cave and you, <laughs> you just, you're there secluded doing your own thing. But other times there's like this secret sort of ba- huge force of hackers behind a lot of the work that's being done um, of really, really talented people working together to, to sort of exploit large systems at scale. Um, I like to think of it sort of as putting together like an A-team uh, where you're like, you know, all these action movies are always like, you got the hacker and the, and the tech guy <laughs> and the driver and the, the gun guy. Like, and, and it's, it's kind of like that when, when you're like building together this team, but you have, you know, so many people, we all know so many people that are really, really good at these things. How do you, um, you know, pull your team together? How, how are you deciding, you know, who you want to work on stuff? Um, like when to reach out for help and not just do something yourself. Cause it's not like there's a bounty here. It's not like you're at risk of, you know duping or anything like that like you're very deep into these systems most times to the point that nobody else is so it's not really like there's a pressure thing what sort of what's the thought process when you start to reach out and build like pull more people into these projects a lot of times like the initial thing for me is like a specific question right so for instance uh like joel you're one of the greatest like mobile hackers that we like i i know nothing compared to you for instance so like whenever like something mobile related that's like confusing or is like really difficult to kind of approach. Like I'll often just like reach out to you and like hit you up. And then, you know, at that point you're like in Corellia making a script and then like it's this collaborative process <laughs> where now you're involved because you've done the thing and you're invested. You're like, okay, what's going on? And then maybe you want to keep yeah. working on it. I nagged a lot, like for the Apple research, like uh, Brett, one of the, when I first started it, it was just me and I was doing it. And I was sending everything to Brett. He must have gotten like, he's got kids, he's got a wife, it's dinner time, his phone's probably blown up. I'm like, Zaya, dude, like, please, like, please hop on this. Like, and uh, he eventually did, right? And then he's like, what's all the fuss about? And he joins in. He's like, oh, this is actually interesting. So I think like, uh, I don't know. I don't have like, there's no elitist, like, there, there's like this concept of like a hacker group or whatever, where like you used to have like this hacker name and like this big, uh, you know, it'd be like Team Poison or something. You've got like the eight members and it's like this kind of elite organization or something. But for bug bounty stuff, it's just like, hey, I'm going to spam you with stuff. And if you can help if you want to. And then maybe you like add one thing and add another thing and then like we build the full picture and then like people get credited and stuff, right? Um, yeah. So yeah. That's good. No, that's good. I mean, I think what I see especially is Everybody ha- has these skill sets. It's just like you said, like I'm good at mobile. So if somebody needs to unpin an app instead of spending four hours, like trying to break their head through their computer screens to, to like figure out how that works, they just send me a message. And I'm like, in 30 minutes, I'm like, okay, here you go. All done. And like that sort of outsourcing of work can be so useful when you're attacking these big targets because they it's just like lots of different skill sets, right? I think that's one of the, aw- one of the really awesome things I've noticed as you attack targets across all spectrums of things whether it's airlines whether it's hotel key cards whether it's isps tlds it's starbucks like it, whatever it is right like they're all using different technologies they're all using different um you know setups and configurations and the method of attack can be different a lot of the time but um you have a really good way of identifying like hey you're good at this thing like help me with this and then not only that but you like pick up that skill yourself really well and then you're able to sort of like foster it and use it later um and and i I think it's really amazing to just sort of see the research as it goes um i did want you to talk a little bit about hack compute actually because as as we're talking about sort of these like big hacking projects and stuff i know that this is something that you and shubs and a couple other people um have been working on sort of maybe quietly ish uh, behind the scenes um but uh yeah you can you just tell a little bit about what that is and everything yeah sure so Hack Compute is kind of like this fun group we put together where it's like, we wanted to have like this idea of like old school style zine publication where it's like fun hacking research that's maybe not, you know, either bug bounty that it, it doesn't end in like, oh, and then we got 20,000 to, it's mostly just kind of fun research, right? And the idea for yeah. it originally is that it would kind of exist as like this kind of like nameless, each blog post would have a different group of collaborators and each post is just, you know, um, and then we would do cool, like high impact research or things that were interesting to the people who wanted to contribute to it. Um, and the, the way it came about was because, uh, when we did the car hacking research a few years ago, um, I like, it, it was kind of like me and a few people originally who were pushing towards like, let's do car hacking. 
and it had this big group chat and there's a lot of people involved. But the blog actually got ended up getting published on samcurry.net, my domain. And even though like the names were listed as collaborators, I still like there's this like kind of small tension of like, hey, like we all did this work, but it's hosted on samcurry.net. And also like I just feel super guilty about it because it's like when people go to see the blog post, it's on samcurry.net. Like it you know, it's like the Facebook, like a Mark Zuckerberg production, whatever for and I just like it it doesn't feel good because you feel like you're stealing people's credit, right? And the idea for Hack Compute is like this idea where it's like intentionally collaborative, where it's behind a name. Um, and that's kind of like the origin of it, right? Yeah. Mm, that's that, awesome. That, that's awesome. That makes Cheers. a lot of sense. And and that way, you know, it can be, and that way uh, lots of different hackers can contribute it too. And it can sort of just be a hub for really awesome hacking achievements. Um Definitely, yeah. definitely excited to see where that goes. And and uh, if I if I ever pop anything not bounty related, I'll I'll let you know, and we can see if we can oh, put it up there. Please, um, yeah, we love we love that. Cool. Uh, okay, I did want to talk about some yeah. technical okay, stuff okay, too. Okay, hold on, no, um, I'm sorry. Just we, before we get before, because I, I I do as well, but we, I actually wanted to hit one more non technical topic before we transition. Is that fine? Okay. Okay. So yeah, yeah, last go for one, it. And then we'll we'll transition into some some hacking stories and getting the technical content. We have our our little doc over here, and it says one of the things you wrote down here: Are we really even solving problems here with <laughs> with bug bounties? <laughs> so and real. I think this is a really interesting <laughs> question, and one that I kind of want to flesh out a little bit with you. Like, what are your thoughts on the efficacy of bug bounty with regards to security as a whole? Uh, yeah, let's leave it at that. Yeah, absolutely. So the conversation around like, is bug bounty solving the issues? Like, I think you could approach it at every angle and pick the supporting evidence and prove every point. So for instance, I could say like, bug bounty isn't solving any problems because your C-surf isn't fixing any real bug that a nation state and someone's always going to social engineer and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, but on the other hand, it's like, bug bounty has like created this like culture of like, AppSec focus, like web security, like heavy, like it's, it's kind of brought itself. Like there's these old school hackers who are doing like internals and windows. And like, they saw web security as like this kind of lame, like cross-site scripting. It's like, mm. who cares? But like nowadays, like everything is web. Like if you wanted to pick a single category of research to get into where you have the most impact and most, you know, expandability, it's like web security. Right. And I think bug bounty has like, have I, everybody having, Bug bounty programs, like pretty much every company has a bug bounty program now, or at least a security contact, right? Well, okay, all right. Um, I'll, I'll, with that caveat, I'll I'll let you off. Caveat: but There's still so many programs that don't pay for 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 bounties, which which is really crazy to me. But yeah, there there's definitely been a, a big expansion of like security.txt and that sort of thing in the past couple of years. Yeah, I'll, I'll even name drop like Cloudflare, yeah. like five k max. Like you run the internet, dude. Like you've got like eighty percent of every yeah. website. It's like please, you know, like increase your bounties because nobody's like nobody's hacking on it for money because you're with, with, with that yeah of a target. I, exactly right. Like I totally agree that like some companies like a hundred percent, but like the difference between like you know, and it's such a I, I, I'm not that old, but even like five years ago or six years ago, it's like you've got like Yahoo and like the mm -hmm. big companies and like, but like companies like uh big big companies are being brought and like doing bug bounty mm. right so with the question of like are we even solving stuff um i think that like appsec and like patching out these like single issues is contributing to this big kind of security culture and knowledge base that is like really really affecting change and like security stuff and you're seeing a lot of pushes now from for instance like a uh, jack cable was a very prolific bug bounty hunter and he got involved in like cisa and like us government stuff and he's helping with this push towards like secure code by design, right? Which is a, a huge, really great effort of like, you know, can we fix, can we, can we take what we've made, adjust it a little bit and fix it like fundamentally? And I think that's like a really great push, but that's kind of my conversation about yeah. that and so, how I feel. So um, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I would say definitely like from a program side and like a security team side, um, you know, I think, most companies should have some sort of at least a security contact, but maybe a bug bounty program as well. Like all the bug bounty program really does is like offer people an incentive as well, right? Like if you want people to come and hack on your company and find vulnerabilities externally, 
then you can offer money for that and you can put money where your mouth is. But if you just want a place for people to be able to reach out, you can do that without a cost. Um, I think it's important that like, you know, no, no products is going to be f free vulnerabilities, right? And like, eventually there's going to be some hacker who's going to want something from like your company and they're going to try and find some way to do that. And if you have some ethical way for them to reach out, that's fine. Um, but like, it's not an end all be all solution. It's not a silver bullet. It doesn't actually create like security in a sense. It, it like, it's just part of the, it's like what you said. It's like, it all flows into like, what is security as a whole? Like what's your security posture and like having some way for external researchers, ethical or bug bounty or whatever to reach out is just part of that posture, but it's not like, Oh, we have a bug bounty program now. Like, Thankfully, all the hackers are now going to submit their vulnerabilities to us and we'll never like, fire all those AppSec engineers. We just need one guy to triage. Like that's, you know, I think that's a really common misconception that a lot of companies think is like, oh, once they spin up a bug bounty program, now they're secured on all fronts. And it's like, you, all you've done is created a doorway or like a mailbox for people to like insert letters, but people could just like ignore that and just walk past it and not give you the letter or like post it on a blog or like reach out via email or like all these other ways so i think post it on a um, blog you know it's, it's a good <laughs> it's, yeah maybe like hack exactly. or something. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but no i i totally agree like i think um it's, it's definitely like just a little a little piece and it, it does solve like some things for sure like there are absolutely things that get caught through bug bounty that wouldn't get caught otherwise but it's such like a mm. niche almost right it's not pen testing it's not internal security it's bug it's like its own little well, part of the pie there's chart. definitely an order of operations there too like like i feel like you should not have a bug bounty program if you don't have 2fa enabled you know or if you don't have like a hardware <laughs> key or something like that because at the end of the day most of the most of the attacks are occurring from phishing and stuff like that but one other thing and i've been kind of toying around with, with this in my head for the past couple of years of like okay you know if, if an attacker is really going to go in they're going to go in by this pathway right um but at the end of the day if you have a bug that is just going to let you let, let's just say theoretically you had a zero day rc on nginx right like that you're always going to use that like they, you're not going to go fish somebody if you've got a, a way in where you have no interaction with any other people especially when these hackers are are spending especially the highly technical ones are spending a lot of time with the computer you know and and, and less time you know deceiving people and you know building those those skills required to do that um so I definitely think there's there's two sides of the coin, and I definitely think there is a lot of risk with but with um from an appsec perspective, and I think the 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 biggest risk though that I think bug bounty really helps absolve is getting users very very deep into your application where actual you're getting hackers really deep into your application where the users are, and then getting trained security eyes on that, incentivized trained security eyes on that, right? Because you know, yeah. all it takes is one user that says, oh, you know, in, in this weird, obscure functionality where, up the, you know, deep, 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 deep in the application where the URL says, oh, you know, user ID equals one, two, three. Look what happens if I change that to a four and then now your database is gone, right? And, and so yeah. getting deep into that and, and getting hackers that deep will help prevent those very obvious, uh, you know, vulnerabilities as well as secure some of those more APT type, type threats. I mean, are yeah. you, you with me yeah. on that? I mean... Right. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean like the, the idea of like an exploitable CVE that comes out and then like you have like 20,000 researchers who immediately spray it on every organization like that has, it reduces the time to fix, oh, yeah. I think significantly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love that it, how it highlights like key areas that need fixing, right? Like systemic things. Like if you see researchers, like every time an XSS comes in, like they're getting an ATO because your cookies are not properly secured or your auth token is stored in a bad place like that's a really easy business justification to be like hey we have external security researchers who are finding this problem we need to fix this like as asap right, right. And, and like there, there's like a one-to-one -one correlation there but it's not always that like it's like sometimes it'll be like a broken social media link and you're like how do i bring this to my engineering team and be like hey guys uh the twitter link is broken <laughs> <laughs> they're like what is what security oh god yeah no that 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 is a pain 
Hey guys, real quick, I just wanted to give a shout to the Hacker Content team. They have been absolutely killing it the past couple months, taking the content from the podcast and condensing it down into consumable social media posts, whether it be shorts or text posts or whatever. They've been rocking it. So uh, I just wanted to give them a shout out and let you know that they do all sorts of cybersecurity content as well as social media management. They do technical blogs. They do uh, comprehensive social media management. Uh, so if your organization could benefit from any of those types of services, make sure you head over to hackercontent.com drop them a line and mention the podcast when you do to get your first month of cybersecurity content marketing services for free. All right, that's it. Let's get back to the pod. All right. So with that, let's, uh, let's, let's set those, those um, stories and, and more philosophical stuff aside and let's go deep into some, some technical stuff. Sound good? All right. Sure. Cool. So Sam, you have so much research <laughs> online, so many stories, um, so many cool things that uh, we need to unpack here. But one of the things you are most well known for is secondary context bugs. Um, I don't know. Did you like the, my first exposure to secondary context was you? Uh, did you did you coin that term? Same. I Dude, did. Yes. So bad. It's funny. <laughs> it's. I appreciate. It. Yeah, it's funny seeing that term like used. I'm like, oh my god. Someone's actually using that word. I just put those two things together. <laughs> that's Dude, like a talk that's, title. That's clutch, man. Uh, but it, 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 I mean, obviously, I'm sure some OG, you know, on some blog back in like, you know, 28, well, <laughs> you know, 2028, 28, 2008. Yeah, in <laughs> the future. Yeah, there you go. No, um, you know, way back, wrote something about it. But, uh, you know, that blog or that talk that you did on secondary context stuff was my first exposure to that. Um and and I think it, it it really made it more uh, widely recognized in the industry. Um, and we have a cool cool bug we can talk about that with the Starbucks bug, um, and that's on SimCurry.net as well uh, that you guys can go read about. But talk to me about when you started realizing secondary context bugs were a thing, and how you started working through that whole concept. Right. Yeah. So my initial exposure to like secondary context bugs was on. Uh, Yahoo's Luminate, which was like Yahoo's small business platform for like deploying websites and stuff. And what I realized was that uh, I originally thought it was like path, like file path traversal, right? Because I was like able to traverse and like add directories. And I'd been spending so long on this mm. one app and I was just like getting, so, and I eventually started testing for it. And I'm like, oh my God, there's file path traversal. And even in, it's funny too, because I blogged about it. And even in the blog post, I refer to it as like, I remember you know, this. Local file I remember this. In. So this was not yeah. a file path traversal. It was not. Yeah, it was actually HB path traversal. But even at the time, like, I'm like, I guess the Etsy password file just didn't exist. And it's like, no, <laughs> that's just not, that's not what was happening. Um, <laughs> so with that kind of exposure to it, uh, I started looking for similar stuff in more and more places. And I eventually realized that, like, the internet was slowly being built towards this, like, interesting, like, network model where, like, oh, you want to serve a CDN from like www.yahoo.com where like you want to serve images, but you don't have to like, you've got this very complicated configuration of like proxy rules and different passes. So maybe that, you know, slash images, instead of being like a folder on like one box because of like load balance, how crazy that would be if it was just all served from the same box. Now the slash images route is being proxied to like some internal server for a CDN, right? That's interesting. Do you think and this that is point, a function of needing to do load balancing more effectively? I think it's a mix of things, right? I think that um, if you're a team who you have like, you know, maybe a static blog, but at the same time, like you have uh, authentication functionality on your static blog and the team who deploys, you know, you've got like DevOps team one, DevOps team two, and then like you have to kind of merge them together. Sometimes the easiest way to like differentiate routes and folders and things, I think, is by adding that reverse mm -hmm. proxy and then separating the services mm -hmm. into two. Um, yeah. So yeah, like, that's probably the biggest thing that I've seen from like the engineering side is it's the service, like that service aspect. A lot of people don't think about this because they're not in, in engineering org, but for engineering orgs, like they split up functionality into services, right? And services are separately deployed. And in order for these things to interact with each other, instead of having just one giant application that's handling everything from one place that can interact internally with everything itself, it has to make some sort of call, whether that's like gRPC or Kafka or whatever. Like, and a lot of times it's just HTTP. They build an HTTP client like for that service that just like calls internal endpoints on that other service on you know their internal network, and it passes data back and forth. And 
it's a lot, you know, it's a lot more simple than people would think where they're like, oh, like, you know, they must have, they're, they're load balancing. It's like, no, they, there's two separate services and they have to talk to each other somehow. And they just did that with an HTTP request and they did it really, really quickly and effectively in a, in an insecure way. And that's where it's, things are starting to fall apart. Right. Yeah, exactly. And like even uh, external services too, like APIs, like maybe you've got like a maps plugin, and like you want to serve that data and you pass in a path that goes like Google Maps API. And like, it's very, very interesting how like complicated it goes. And I think one of the reasons like this kind of research kind of came about, there's different people who had worked on like similar things in the past. There's really excellent blog post, like Franz Rosen. Um, he, he, sh- he should have been the, like, he should be the originator. Um, his work with like Matthias and others, like, I think probably been a few years before that talk. And I even messaged him when I gave a talk. I said, like, I feel like this is similar to a lot of work that you've done in the past. And it, I was like, if there's anything here, like, I'm going to make sure to credit you for a lot of this. Um, I want to make sure I'm not, like, stepping on your toes a little bit. But uh, I wanted to say, like, the the way that, the way that, I totally lost my train of thought. So, but, maybe I can, maybe I can oh, redirect sorry. you. That, Go ahead, that, yeah. That's fine. The, the, uh, so as you're starting to develop this this understanding of uh, essentially modern web architecture where these reverse proxies are in, are in place like that um and the the tricky part for me still lies in where does the authentication live because there's there's a lot of there's a lot of uh secondary context patch reversals all over the place but the backend server is also using auth and it's just like, okay, well I can hit a different endpoint, you know? And sometimes you can do weird stuff with that, like, like C surfs or like, um, you know, some sort of, um, method confusion and, and that sort of thing. But, uh, the majority of the time that have, understanding that auth piece is really, is really pivotal. Right. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, the auth component is so important to everything because like, if you're a, like, a lot of structures, for instance, uh, we saw this a lot in the car hacking where, uh, as an example, like, you have Sirius XM at the top where there's di- all these different vehicle brands beneath it, like Ford, you know, whatever. But the Sirius XM service is, like, the authenticated one. So each of those car-, car companies has, like, an API key that they use globally. So it's, like, once you, if you can leak that key, change the context between, like, one user with access to one thing, and then like you leak the key, and then you can talk to that service and directly you access to that backend service. Yeah, exactly right. So one example there is like, you know, maybe you're fuzzing for you know secondary context stuff, and you throw in like a new line character for a URI parameter instead of like your account ID. Maybe you do one two three percent zero D, and then you get a stack trace back where it's like the API call to internal.company.com question mark API key equals, and you're like, aha, I see the API key. You take that, and then you're like, hey, team, this is allowing me to access anybody's stuff. So you give it wow. to them, right? But like you said, the authentic, the auth- yeah, it's... This sounds like a very real it's example, tricky to figure Sam. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe it is, but, uh, you know, doing some uh, hacking on the <laughs> program recently, and I don't know if you can disclose their bugs, mm. but there's a lot of similar stuff like there, right? Mm. With, the, with the secondary context stuff? Yeah, I've it's like a... Yeah, there's tons of, uh, a lot of the, for instance, like, a lot of people hunt for actuators, like, really heavily, and, like, when you start exploring, like, actuator secondary context stuff, it's really fun, because it's, like, you know, in some JavaScript file somewhere, there's, like, this route, which is a reverse proxy, maybe it's, like, API GW dash, you know, internal slash or something, then you hit that route, and then that's where you append your actuator end, or, like, dot dot semicolon slash actuator end, and then, like, it lets you kind of hunt more thoroughly, so hitting- I guess. I guess in this scenario, you're hitting dev API API dev endpoints using this this um, new secondary context sort of path traversal. So going through the front end, then traversing on the back end, hitting these actuator endpoints, which wouldn't be exposed publicly because of probably path limitations um, through the reverse proxy, and and then like, are you normally hunting for things where it's going to dump the full response back to you without any modification or are you you know trying to hit these things blind because a lot of times there's a parsing of the response from that backend api and then that that kind of hex up your your visibility into the back end right right yeah the having a response is beautiful it makes you so happy when you see that hp response leaked back to you you feel amazing but a lot of times it is blind right and i was with uh, another researcher nathaniel 
it, yeah. it really is. Um, it's like a, I, I would say too, like to finish that a bit, like a Nathaniel Latimer yeah. donut. Um, I was with him on a trip and I like storm into his hotel room, like manically with my laptop. I'm like, if I do dot, dot, slash ABC, it doesn't do anything. But if I do dot, slash X, Y, Z, it does this thing. But like, I can't reproduce it on this one. And like, he, he's looking at me. I've sat there for six hours trying to figure it out. And he's like, this guy, like, what is he talking about? Like, it's absurd. Because there are so many conditionals that relate to like the, uh, you know, like you're trying to explain to your friend, you're like, if I do a pound sign, it does this behavior. And if I do an ampersand, it's this behavior. And like, you have to like, really build out this like brain map for each individual case, right? I think the most complicated like secondary context bug I had was like this stored, uh, you would add a value to a database with like an and sign and like change the print. You change the oh. format from XML to JSON. Yeah. And then like on another endpoint, you'd call it and it would get retrieved it. Like, and it was How just like- How did you like, identify? So it's like a pe- stored secondary context. I've never even thought about a stored secondary context. Yeah, uh, logically, yeah. a lot of times uh, it can be uh, some things I think you can look for there. If it's like external services, like a- external APIs that you know, for instance, uh, you know, are, are they leveraging some third party API that has an API mm-hmm. key or like, or, is there one you've already identified that's like you can kind of add on to? Um, but they're so case by case, right? Like one service has like one behavior and you, ha- you, have, you have to build those mind maps, I guess. Yeah, it, 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 when you're talking about the external services, it makes me, it reminds me of the Starbucks bug. And just to give a, a, a quick overview of this, um, like essentially what, in this scenario, we actually had access to the full response, right, that was coming back. And and we were able to, on that one, we were able to path traverse back on, on the Starbucks API and hit, it was, it was a third party, right? It was Microsoft, was it Graph? Yeah, it was a Microsoft graph search. I think it was like a, they had like a, I don't know if it was a third party service or it was a utility they had, but it was connected to their core, their, their core Starbucks, a hundred million user records was it was connected yeah. to. And, and, and so but. essentially like we, we were working on this together and what amazed me when we were working on this together was one that, that you identified one that leaked the full response, which allowed us to get so much more interesting data back. But um uh, but for two, you were able to brute force these paths along the way. And I just, I don't know, man. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I don't do a lot of brute forcing as a part of my methodology. But it's just, that's just some, and Franz, Franz does it even weirder. I mean, Franz brute forces <laughs> it as well. But Franz also just has like this sixth sense of like, you know what? I bet customer is before this. And, and it's like, and then he'll <laughs> guess because we, we were working on this target and it was like, and yeah. it was, we weren't allowed to brute force. They said explicitly, literally no brute force. Please do not brute force it, okay? And so we're, we're like, we need to brute force it because how are we going to figure out the paths, you know, that we're traversing? And Franz just guessed four paths deep. <laughs> and I'm like, That's so good. you've got to so be funny. kidding me, man. Um, so I guess for this, in your experience with the brute forcing, what is your approach to that? What word lists are you using? Are you generating custom things? You know, is it just something I've got to start doing and that I'm not doing? Yeah, I mean, a really, a really simple list that I like to use. Um, it's in BERT mm. by default, but it's like server side variable names. And it's just like, Never heard you that. know, path parameter. Yeah, Exili, uh, Mike mm. Robert showed me this. Like, he uses it from time to time for like parameters and stuff. But I think if you go to the simple list, it's like server side variable names. Huh. But, uh, the thought process for trying to brute force the paths or guess the paths is like one, it lets you confirm that like you're not just traversing to like the same request you're on. Cause a lot of the times what will happen is like you think you're traversing, but in reality it's like a normal side, like API mm-hmm. request where it's being condensed down to the normal request. So you're actually just calling yourself. So, um, annoying. but yeah, it's very, you're like, Oh, I'm just, you know, you like spam someone about it and you're like, delete our messages. You're like, never mind, ignore me. Um, but the, uh, but brute forcing the paths is really fun because like, you know, you can kind of guess like, for instance, if it's Franz, I've mispronounced his name for 10 years, you know, so I apologize. Um, but he, he would doing a customer like makes a lot of sense where you can kind of guess the format ish, like V1, you know, V2, V3, whatever, but building it out. Um, I wish there was more general tips, but it really is case by case basis, you know? Are they using camel case, up, lowercase, upper, 
Are they separating with yeah, underscores? Are you looking at the front you know? end like paths for that to, to determine that information? Or you, because I guess at some point it's getting proxied back through. So maybe they're using similar name conventions on the back end as well. Yeah, that, that's one thing that uh, you can kind of pick up on. It's like on the front end, if they refer to your account as like account underscore ID or something like that, you know, those variable names that are like normal, you can kind of like interplace those. Um, most of the time I'll just send it through. If there's no rate limiting, I have like a massive word list that Chubbs gave me that is like 500,000. Yeah, that's like, word list absurd. are really good. They're really good, yeah. Um, so, oh, so I did want to ask... Um, you mentioned that you have these mind maps that you do. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about what that means to you and sort of like how that plays into any note taking you do? And like, because again, like you typically are hacking on very large scale targets and these are ongoing engagements for weeks, months at a time. Um, and so there's a lot of information, a lot of data, a lot of connecting parts together. And even on single like, small scope programs that exist and that can be hard to track. We've talked a lot about note taking and all that kind of stuff. How do you keep track of everything? How, how are you remembering these GAD? Is it all just like a bulletin board in your mind that is very <laughs> just like fragile or is, or do you, are you writing stuff down? Like, can you talk a little bit about that? I wish I can hardly remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. Um, mostly <laughs> it's a discord channel with people like mostly if I find something interesting, anything interesting whatsoever, I'll post like the JavaScript file I found it in. If it was a JavaScript file, and then like the route, and then maybe talk a little bit about it because I'm normally trying to communicate it to somebody else in the group chat. Like, hey, this is interesting for this reason. So then I kind of like catalog that, and I can go back to it. Um, and then like pending messages, things like that. But for building out like, you know, on like the longer engagements, like building out an understanding, it's a lot of like, uh, you know, maybe you go to developer.company.com, you register for an API key, and you kind of look through their API requests. So for instance, uh, we could kind of transition this if you wanted to, but we found a vulnerability, I think it was on uh, Vercel. Mm. Um, yep. Yeah, but Vercel is a really good example because for Vercel, Vercel has this API where they talk about like all of their API requests that you can make yourself as a developer. And there's a custom endpoint on the Vercel website that takes in a parameter of your account ID. And it basically generates a screenshot of your website. So it was like slash Very account ID slash... There. Yeah. Yeah. It was super mm -hmm. fun. Um, but what was really interesting is that when you give it the, the parameter for the website, so it's like your slash account ID slash website ID, maybe like one, two, three, slash one, two, three, four or something. You could actually um, traverse the one, two, three, four and overwrite the full API call. And what, what I realized is that from reading the normal documentation for Vercel, it was actually making the API request to itself that was a normal documented process that you could read as a person, right? So we reproduced it and we realized that what it was doing is it was fetching a JSON response from a particular endpoint and it was parsing out the URL parameter. So this API request to make a screenshot, it would pull the, the URL from the website ID and then it took a screenshot of that specified URL. How but what you, it was how doing- How did you suss that out? How did you know that it was pulling that from the JSON response? You had to have seen the response somehow, right? So I never, I never saw, saw the response, but what I did is I figured out the request by- I did the thing that you know, Franz said where you're backtracking every right. single request until you rebuild the full request. And then uh, in that response, I was like, it has to be hitting this specific endpoint. And the only thing from this response that makes sense is the URL parameter. What? So, Sam, yeah. It's, this, it's, is, this is the kind of shit I'm talking about, dude. Like, how? So, so, so you traverse back, you look at the path, and then you just say, okay, guess. Um, there is going to be, in the, res the JSON response... <laughs> at the root level, no like data, you know, data colon this or whatever, there's going to be a URL attribute and then they're going to read that. And yes. that's the only thing they're reading from the response. Are you kidding me? Yeah. It's a bit of like, you know, there's, you use the website enough a little bit. I don't know. There's just something like you slowly build it up. I think from like hacking on the same target for a while. Right. And then like, you can leverage that. Like, and I think the, I think the final exploit for that was like, uh, you could upload your own data to Vercel and then you could backtrack the API to load your own data and then you would load your uploaded JSON and it would sign that URL and then you could basically load anybody's staging domains or bypass their SSO because what it was doing was uh, like 
you know, signing a URL using your own token. So like, or signing the URL using a master right. token from Vercel that had access to everybody's stuff, right? Um, wow. So, okay, yeah, well, I mean, so, so let me get this straight. This is, this yeah. is nuts. So what you did is you find a, a secondary context path traversal. You identify by using whatever the heck that was a second ago, big brain nonsense, that you need to put a URL Sam, I, I really actually can't even wrap my head around this. No, because you're not even getting a hit. You're not even hitting an external server. What, what you're guessing is that you went all the way through this this whole thing, and then you uploaded a JSON file to the account, and then traversed and hit that, and then you were deciding, okay, I need to put a URL parameter in there, like a, a URL JSON value in there? Sam, that's yeah, ridiculous. Exactly. That doesn't make any freaking sense, Sam. <laughs> Well, it's, just, it's a lot of, uh, I don't know. It's a lot of it, guessing is it what it sounds like. It made sense like. to me that It's day. a lot of guessing and intuition, which which is very, for, for me, yeah. that is definitely not my strong suit in bounties. Like most of my stuff is very much, yeah. I think, logically oriented and logical flows. But this was a lot of guessing and a lot of intuition. What I mean, is it, is it just something that you feel uh, when you're doing this? Because that, like, and, and I can I can understand that in some scenarios, like the Franz thing um, with traversing back and then guessing the path, like that amazes me for sure. But I can understand it a little bit because like, okay, you know, you understand the architecture of APIs, but something like this where you're guessing the structure of the response and you don't even have it hitting your own server. So it's not, but you have to like upload a JSON file and then traverse to that and then help. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so, so I was, I, I'd like to say, um, you mentioned intuition here and I was listening yesterday to a really interesting podcast about intuition and like when you can and cannot trust your intuition. Okay. And intuition is one of those things that's like really built up over time, um, as like a skill where like you, uh, uh, back to chess, right? You see this all the time with chess where chess grandmasters, um, they have played chess for so long that they have a mental intuition of what moves make the most sense even if they can't really explain why it makes sense because they've done it so many times for so long they've thought about so many different hands and scenarios and and moves and everything that they're like you know this makes the most sense i can't really explain why but it does and they're right um and i think a lot of that is the same with bug bounty where it's like this intuition that you hone in over time um both on individual targets but also like as a whole right so i think uh I was I was looking back through our messages because uh, like a month ago you you'd said this thing that really stuck with me and you're like there's a five day hump on any program quote Franz Rosen on this and if you brute force brute, pa- brute force past this you become an unstoppable force and I love that because I think that is like your intuition being like hang on a second I'm a I'm a dull right now you got to sharpen me up yeah. a little bit and after five days then you've got this specific intuition for the target you're looking at right like when you're testing stuff and you're like you know it's got to be a url parameter in the the response to this json body it's because (laughs) you've got five plus days of like banging your head against the wall basically going back and forth with like what is this developer doing like what why why did they make this choice oh they do things like that oh okay that's weird but all right i guess that's just how they do things and you just sort of build this this like understanding of how a specific company does things internally. Um, and back to the intuition part, right? When you can trust your intuition is when you're in an environment that is like slow to change. And so especially when you've honed your in- intuition on a target, that target is not going to be like, yesterday we were doing things this day, this way, but tomorrow we're going to do it completely <laughs> differently. Yeah. Right. And so you can actually hone your intuition on a target like really, really well because you do understand how they do things you can build up an understanding like implicitly internally of like okay this is probably how they're actually doing this and i think like that's something you do a really good job of capitalizing on right i totally agree with that like the uh that happened too with like tesla I, this is sort no, of a no, similar no, bug where it's don't, like don't no, yeah, no, no, sorry hold on. i'm not letting you weasel your way out of that <laughs> last one okay don't even start with me right now okay so, so okay we're gonna go to that one and i want to hear that one but let's just you know, rewind a little bit yep, here yep. and and finish this one up. Okay, so you do some big brain shit and you figure out okay, there's a URL parameter. What do you put in the URL? The URL parameter in the parameter JSON attribute in the response uh, of this traversed backend API request. Are you putting in your own host? Are you putting in 
uh, initially or? Yeah. So originally what I did is I put in my own host and I saw that there's a like signed header, which is like a session. It's like, this is the URL signed that way the server can like access it, you know, because Vercel's God key mm. is being signed here and it loads Dude, the website. I wish it would just send you but, the God key, man. <laughs> I agree. Like I, I was, I was kind of annoyed by it. Um, and funny enough, one of the reasons that like we ended up going so deep on this bug is, uh, I think Ian Carroll knows how to like psychologically manipulate <laughs> me because, uh, Whenever we hack together, he just tells me. I was sitting next to him at a hotel, and uh, we were trying to hack on Brussel. And he's like, "There's no bug there. Like, you can't find anything." I'm like, "I'm going to show you. Like, I will pull a bug out. Like, if it's like through a tiny little like fishing uh, this wire." Is starting to make you know sense I mean? now. Ian was Ian was trolling yeah. you into this bug. Okay, I see. He did this at uh, the. He did this at the uh, recently, yeah, but but yeah, like there, I tested my own URL. I saw I was sending a request. I saw it was signed. And then I was like, well, I can't really sign anything arbitrarily because I tried all the bypasses. I did like backslash at, you know, at uh, credentials, basic auth, you know, to try to get it to sign a URL that like try to parse out uh, part one of the URL where it's like HPS victim.com or HPS, uh, sorry, victim.com backslash at attacker.com where like it would sign the URL for the victim website but give me the signed credentials and then I could take those credentials and authenticate. But what ended up happening that was a lot easier is we could just pass in the victim URL directly. So there's no bypass needed because it would just screenshot okay, the website. Okay. So what you were right? trying to do there was somehow leak to yourself the signed headers, but, but it, it, you know, the request has to be sent to you. So it, it, it isn't going to work that way, right? Because you can only sign things that are going to be pointing towards your own domain so then you just put in the victim's website directly and use the functionality on the website exactly right because i was i was annoyed i was like there has to be some like differentiator between the hp request actually firing and then like the security parsing for the url so i was looking for any difference between the two right yeah. because if sense. the security parsing was slightly different yeah exactly um but yeah that was kind of the process for but that then how did you uh, no 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 sam yeah. But then, then how did you how did you know the? I mean, did you just pass in? Was it just like HTTPS victim dot com, whatever? Exactly. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very simple for that part. Okay, so you, you don't you didn't have to like guess some sort of path or anything like that with the IDs for the victim. It was literally just you give them the victim website and it just returns you an image of the victim's website. Exactly. Nice. Yeah, and I was really happy with that. that very simple. Solid. So very that part clean. was simple. Okay. Yeah. Solid. Very cool, man. Okay, so now okay, talk about right, Tesla. Let's sure, sure. So, <laughs> yes, intuition. You honed your intuition, and you said this ha this happened on Tesla as well. Yeah, sure. So for Tesla, I was really frustrated because, like, I really want. I have it. I own a Tesla, and I like. I really wanted to hack it for a while. And the Tesla API is like really fascinating because, like, there's like a single API for the Tesla owners to use that can do all the stuff for the Tesla cars, and the authorization. A lot of times, um, one thing I've noticed a lot for like certain companies is they'll do this thing where they'll they'll sign a JWT or something and then they'll have the value in the URL where it's like, maybe it's email at email.com and then in the URL they'll pass in like email at email.com. And then to validate that you're off, they just compare the two, right? For Tesla in particular, I noticed they had an account ID or a vehicle ID. And I was like in the JWT, so, or JOT, however you want to say it. But, Don't correct me. No, podcast no. Listening. <laughs> but but no. uh, anyway, the... Nobody's right on that one. The good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but for Tesla, it's really cool because there's this endpoint where you pass in the vehicle ID and it was like signing the JBT. But what you could actually do is it was using a particular integer parsing where if you appended like ABC at the end of the integer, it would run parsent on it where it would only retrieve the number. So in the actual logic check for authorization, it would pull out, you know, parse, uh, parse ent, whatever you provided, check if it's you know, valid and that you're authorized to access it. And it would take the raw value that you originally sent and it would send it in a second request, right? So what you could actually do mm. that was really neat is you could do like your ID, uh, percent two F dot dot percent two F victim ID. And then it would basically, it would bypass the check via the parse end and then it would take your raw request, but it would actually on the back end traverse to the victim account and then you get access to the victim's vehicle. 
Wow, so, dude. Mm. Okay, so I'm looking at this. So the, the reason that works Super is parse int yeah. in, in JavaScript. If you pass it a string that says yeah. one, two, three, four slash test, it will return one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Yeah, exactly, okay. right? That's hecked up. That's yeah. some JS shit if I've ever seen it. Um, yeah. Okay, but that that's really helpful to know, especially on, on node targets, because it's like they might be using parse int to get the integer value for this thing. And then if they're using that, so then they, they don't use the parsed value, they use the original value again in the second backend API request. Exactly. And that's the fun part, because you can just provide in like the victim ID. It's really neat. Um, and there's a similar thing too with PHP. This is a kind of one some people, like I said, know is that there's a dollar sign underscore request. There's dollar sign underscore get and dollar sign underscore post and put and whatever, right? But what's really interesting is that if you do dollar sign request and you do a logic check with dollar sign request, um, like let's say the ID parameter, and then you de- validate that parameter, um, you can actually do if 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 for any reason it switches to get or post after that. Uh, request could be like the one from the get and then post could just be the one from the post. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that request is indifferent to, or, or request is like specific to one of those. It's either get or post and, uh, the logic switches up once you switch to like either get or post where you can basically provide like question mark ID equals one, two, three in the URL. And then in the post body, you provide one, two, four. And request pulls the top one, and then post is the second one. Ah, and mm-hmm. yeah, interesting. It's led to like a Wait, lot so of you've seen yeah. that in the back end in the same back end API call. So like like you, where you'll put the the victim's ID or let, let's say your ID in the URL, and then. It, wait, is this a part of the normal functionality of this application where they have the ID in two spots, or you say, or is you specifically adding? I, yeah, no specifically way. adding. Dude, that's um, that's it was really, freaking weird. <laughs> yeah, that's super weird. It was funny. Yeah, it was really funny too because it was uh, for, I was playing like a Korean MMO, which was like super grindy and like you had to pay like $100 if you wanted to like level your character up or get a special item or something. And I, I ended up reporting the bug, so don't get mad at me yet. Um, but what you could do is it would have like your package value. So it's like a $400 package and I'd pass that in. And then it would sign the whole request and pass it off to the payment provider. But what you could do is like, in the get request, you're like, okay, fine, I'll pay $500. And then the post request you do, ah, let's actually change it to a penny. And that gives you the signed <laughs> checkout URL that's passed to like the payment provider. And you complete the checkout process and you can only buy it for a penny. So then you get your $500 package. And I think I got a really funny email from the game developer. They said, we noticed some erratic activity in your account. You spent $3 million. <laughs> See, in, in yeah, this items. is what I'm talking about. Like, like, why do you do this shit? Like, I understand the hacking things that don't, you don't have, like, you know. I, I would love to know <laughs> the thought process, actually. Like, when you receive an email like that, are you excited? Or are you like, oh, shit. Uh, like, uh-oh. <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little bit of both. Um, I hope they understand that, like, my thing is, like, I like to, like, walk the line between both. It's like, I hope you're not going to like pull out, like sue me and get me in trouble. And I hope that me doing it isn't like too terrible for you to deal with. I I think it's similar to like, maybe if I did a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or whatever, but like, I I don't know that, that line is like interesting to walk. I better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, you know, like I think like when, it's a very particular thing because like you try, I try my best not to like, actually I'm not like going out and impacting the game yeah. economy. I'm immediately contacting them to report it. And like, they're aware of my account and stuff, you know? Um, but you still but have the coolest for this case, in the game for sure. <laughs> exactly. Right. Like, <laughs> well, it's funny too. Cause my buddy, uh, a long time ago when I was like 11 or 12 years old, even I played video games with this guy named mm-hmm. Buzzman and Buzzman did video game hacking and he did tons of video game hacking and I looked up to him a lot. And he was like this Belgian researcher. And then uh, when I was 17, I checked his Facebook. And he runs like the, one of the biggest game security companies. No way. And uh, he actually had these people as a client. And I like passed it to him. Mm. And he got good PR. Cause he's like, hello, we found a bug from, you know, and it, this researcher reported it. Um, 
So really funny wow. story, but Buzzman is a genius. Yeah, very wow. smart guy. So okay, so so That's just to awesome. bring that back yeah. to the technical takeaway there, which was sometimes you can add parameters to the see, you know, and this is a very common IDOR tactic as well, you know, where you'll see a um, you know, an ID in the URL parameter and in the post body. And what it'll do is the auth check for the URL and then not auth check the the post body. So that that one's a well established I you know, IDOR mentality. But this is this is also applying in in this sort of scenario where you can get you can add it specifically to one or the other, and I, I kind of right I, I I kind of am curious how that actually would work on the back end because it's like okay you know I can see how they would do path level authorization in those other scenarios but I can't really see how they'd be like all right you know let's just say it's PHP here. Um, dollar sign underscore get you know that and then check yeah. but maybe it's it's request but then it's overriding it you know but it, you, you know what i'm saying like how does this work yeah so i think what originally happened was it was a put request and it, the auth check was using underscore request mm -hmm. right and when it was a put request i think php was like oh cool it's a request it's a put request it's coming from the body right but then in the actual logic of the application it did underscore get right weird so auth check request, actual functionality was get. Or, yeah, or maybe exactly. there's like right. a, if there's a get parameter that has this specific, you know, like user ID or whatever, then perform the auth check and then auth check equals true or whatever. You know, after that, yeah. maybe it too. Wow. Very interesting, Sam. I hadn't I had never thought of that. That's that's a that's a pretty cool one to to take away. Um and that, that's mostly regarding authorization stuff for these, or, or I guess, it, like you said, it could override values, application level values as well. And it make, makes me think of a um, client-side path traversal that I recently found, which is my my shit right now. I just love client-side path traversal vulnerabilities. But essentially what it was is, um, you know, the, the target would send a an empty uh, post request to a given endpoint once I've done the, the client-side path traversal in the URL. Um, and I needed to, to send parameters in that, that request. Um, and to, 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 you know, manipulate the application level logic, add an admin user to the organization. And what I did instead was just added them to the query parameter with the path traversal. So I just did, oh. you know, question mark. Yeah. I use ID thing. equals one, two, yeah. three, you know, and you know, add type equals admin. Yeah. And yeah. you see this a lot, actually, where, where modern web frameworks, they've made it significantly easier to use one thing to reference parameters, right? Whether that's get or post or it's like i just want i don't really care how it comes in if it's a post request or get request i just want the parameter called id right it makes my web application mm -hmm. more flexible for but for an attacker it's like okay well what if i provide both like what is what is request dot parameters yeah. id now uh, yeah. I, I really i really like that that that's pretty rad very very cool tip I'm, I'm trying to look through here and see some of the other things we have associated with secondary uh context path traversals before we move on to some of your research uh, oriented stuff um the or, the other thing that I see here is, so we covered fuzzing for endpoints. Um, we've kind of mentioned this on the, on the pod before, but figuring out where you are in that sort of backend API is something you're really good at. And also, actually, I want to come back because we didn't finish the Starbucks, the Starbucks thing. One of the other things that I realized was really awesome about your Starbucks path traversal was that the traversal was slash or backslash dot dot backslash dot backslash. Right, that was the traversal se sequence, right? Where it, normally it's just dot dot slash or you know dot dot backslash, but in this one you had to space it out with dots in between. Why were you doing that, and what kind of similar methodologies do you have with that that may help? Yeah, at the time I think that was an Akamai WAF bypass, which is really funny because Akamai has grown oh so much gosh. since then. Yeah, so if you did like dot dot slash dot dot slash, it's like stop. That's too many backward <laughs> slashes. But you're like dot slash dot slash dot dot slash. <laughs> And it's like, all right, you know, like that checks out. And I think maybe Akamai even like in the blog post, it was like kind of a call out because I was like, yeah, WAFs are bad. This is why this worked. So I think maybe they're like, damn, we got to fix our bad. Not saying Akamai is, well, I'm the reason Akamai fixed their thing, but it was a little call out to Akamai. I was like, damn, this was like kind of embarrassing. You guys need to get yourself together. Maybe pay better yeah, bounties. So, so, I mean, when you're doing this, I've seen you do like even spaces and new line character, what, what kind of stuff are you trying in order to achieve these backend traversals? And what kind of stuff have you seen work with any consistency? Yeah, so one person who really kind of helped and like kind of get my methodology good to this is Andre, or sorry, Andre, 0xACB. Um, 
Andre Baptista, I think is how you say his last name, but he is uh, one of the best, like has one of the best methodologies. He even made a tool for this where it's like, if you're trying to tra- tra- traverse directories, there are certain areas where you should be fuzzing. So for instance, you could do dot, dot, percent, zero, zero to FF slash. So then instead of, you would basically add before the slash an, a character there and then you enumerate through all the hex code. And then, you know, maybe percent zero D gets removed when it gets tra- like transacted in the next API. Yeah. And then it turns into... This is recollapse, is that right? Yeah, recollapse, yeah. Uh, recollapse is great. Um, so my methodology for like trying to figure out if directory traversal works is like, try the normal stuff, you know, dot, dot, backslash, dot, dot, percent zero D slash, dot, dot, whatever. But then if I can't figure it out, I'll just send it to intruder and then do zero, zero to FF. Okay. And I've had like really... Yeah, I've had some good luck just like with random stuff, like percent zero nine, like a tab or something sometimes for like dot oh, yeah. applications would work. And it's, yeah, it's really fun. No, I, I like that, um, that whole brute force, the, the URL per, or the URL decoding space essentially, um, percent zero or zero zero to percent FF. That, that's, that's quite good. I, and I use that often as well. Um, and I, you know, sometimes there's some weird Unicode bypasses that that won't hit. Um, but those are pretty, pretty rare edge cases. And I, I kind of, th- that's something that I would like to put a little bit more thought into is how can we apply, like, I, I, essentially, I mean, there's too many Unicode characters, so we can just brute force the whole Unicode space, but it would be really interesting to categorize like, okay, these are like white space-ish Unicode characters or something like that that might get converted and make those into a list for brute forcing as well, because that would be really helpful to have in that in that list as well. 100%. And there was a good uh, blog post too. I think it was like Unicode S's for GitHub to bypass email OAuth flows. I could maybe Google it yeah. really quick. It was uh, um, GitHub Unicode bug bounty. Let's see. Uh, find it. You said it was the GitHub? Google part. Turkish, yeah, Turkish dotless I. Turkish dotless I. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh wow! This yeah. is uh, this is this is one of my favorites. Andre has another thing for this. I don't. I'm not going to give the exact URL, but it's some somewhere on his website. He has a normalization table that I use all the time, and it's it's very similar to this, where it's just like you know all the standard characters, and then under every single one, it's just a list of all the normalization possibilities, like different v- varieties and stuff of that character and you can just go through and you can try them you know on your on your you know your target and i use oh, that dude. all the time when i'm trying to that. bypass filters <laughs> yeah it's super uh, useful gonna, yeah, i'll send you a link to yeah, it we'll, gonna, we'll keep I'm it private but yeah dm you right now to send send me <laughs> unicode list <laughs> that's great okay so so sam just why don't you talk us through this so hacking github's oauth with Un- or unicode turkish dotless i how does this work yeah, so I think it was a email issue where basically like GitHub supported a bunch of different OAuth flows. So I think that when you did uh scroll through really quick. Ah, so you, they would put the Turkish dotless I after the G in GitHub at github.com. Right. Oh. Yeah, exactly. And and then uh yeah, it emails the original one and then actually show this up as the second one so you can just basically steal people's so i I think what what happened was like the email client or the authorization was like oh that's you know uh a different domain that's not uh, github.com but yeah there's an issue there somewhere where it confused both these these unicode normalization bugs are every time i I see this i think of andre because of his just legendary bugs he's pulled off at almost every live hacking event he's been to he's done something with crazy with these unicode normalization bugs um there's a lot of stuff i mean andre is one of those people i think that especially us three have pulled a lot of we've done a lot of hacking with him and we pulled a lot of inspiration mm. off of him as well like even just like the leaking header stuff that we were talking about earlier like that was andre's first mm. lhg uh, mbh was leaking a token through like an external request to his server from like an internal you know thing that was like a master token like same you know very 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 similar type stuff and that was you know, five Dude, plus years ago so here we are in full circle yeah that was crazy yep. and i yeah, I have to call it out too, because like 
Andre is one of those people where it's not just computers. Like when he's hacking, he's like, this is the galaxy. Like this is the matrix. Like we're in space right now, like going through like portals and like, it's so much larger than just like an API for him. It's like, yeah, it's, I love the energy is so good. Love Andre. So I love much. Andre's energy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so actually on the topic of energy and we'll circle we can we can circle back to technical stuff, but this was something on the philosophy thing that I did want to want to highlight with you. Um you have this really intense energy um in a good way, like when it when it comes to hacking, like you, when you are focused on a target, Justin always describes me as like a laser beam that he can uh he can nerd snipe to point in the right <laughs> direction. And I I I view Sam as like uh the Death Star <laughs> Ray in that same sense, right? So like it's like 100 x where when you're really fixated on something, when you're focused on like I want to get this thing, like there is nothing that's gonna really stop you from doing that. Um and you have like this like industrial sized fan on your flame right so how do you like how are you able to like do you does it just come naturally all the time like you just find yourself in these situations or do you find um that you fall out of that headspace and that you have to do certain things to get yourself back in there yeah i don't know i, I think honestly a lot of it stems from like uh hacking was like one of the original things where it's like i felt like a this is gonna sound so like convoluted psychologist whatever but like the uh original like a sense of uh i don't know appreciation was like finding something cool so like i have this really deep down thing where it's like if i want to like prove a point and like find the bug that's how i feel like a sense of validation for my peers mm, and stuff yeah. or whatever so like if i if i have a goal which i feel like is like interesting to me and like i prove a point to somebody or something like that you know like it's like i want to i'm gonna do it so like it, it transitions and it comes up pretty naturally where like I'm like, yo, like that thing looks interesting and I bet I could do it. Um, and it's like a fun, I don't know how to describe it, but it, it comes very naturally where it's like, you know, for instance, like, yes, something just get like gets under your skin a little bit. Like Ian being like, there's nothing here or like whatever it is. Or, or you just being like, that's really interesting. I wonder if that's possible or whatever it is. Exactly. And just sort of like following that, that, that dopamine or whatever that, that interest Yes, example. A perfect example of that, like recently too, is like, uh, is it okay if I transition to the Go ISP hacking a little bit? Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, uh, yeah, like I, I had a call with my ISP technician because like I moved into a new house and like I couldn't get it set up, and like it was just kind of frustrating. They're like, I'm gonna remotely change your password. I'm like, you can do that. Like you can remotely change my modem's password. I was like, I had no idea that was possible, and I was like, I wonder what they have access to to do that. Oh my gosh, Dude. I have a. Yeah, it was, it was fascinating because I'm like, this is really cool. So like, I spent a while investigating my own ISP and I eventually found this vulnerability because like deep down at the core of the ISP, they had built this internal API called Sale. And what Sale was used for was customer support agents and normal people to manage their router to push commands to update their router, view router settings. And it was called Sale and it would basically bypass the authorization layer to do things like update DNS or fetch device password or things like that. Fetch and I was like, if that's password, possible, not, not just reset you could, to fetch it as well. You, you can do everything. I mean, you can do, and this is the modem, right? This is, this is a modem and this is the modem they issued everybody. It's not just yeah. their, their ISP modem. It, it's any compatible. So modem. It's, it's fascinating, right? Because to even go back two years ago, um, to give a little, even more context is like, I was hacked. Like I, I got hacked. I was on my laptop and I curled a box. And what I realized was that a third party DigitalOcean IP was resending my exact same HP request. So I thought originally my computer was owned and then I opened the URL on my iPhone and I saw the exact same DigitalOcean IP was resending that same traffic. So somebody somewhere was like intercepting my traffic and I researched it and it was an IP that was related to like a phishing campaign and, uh, basically, what I think happened was someone had compromised my modem, right? And uh, so, sorry for so much background for this, but um, it got me really interested in like hacking ISPs. But anyway, I found a way to remotely, uh, you can remotely take over anybody's router. Um, you can update their DNS, update their password settings, things like that um, via just so, their serial number. How did, which you is find, a, how did you find their, that, that API in the first place? Yeah, so what it was, was uh, there's a uh, is the ISP that was affected. Um, 
there's a business management website. So for business customers, and they have access to like a little bit more functionality. So if you're a business customer and you want to manage your uh, router or modem um, to like update stuff remotely or see the connected devices remotely, it would take in your request and like pass it down. And what I realized is that there is a bypass to traverse down and access the Swagger files for the API sorry, routes. Sorry, I'm going to pause you and back up a little bit there. Yep. What, why do you? Why sorry, did you? Yeah. Why were you looking at the business? I mean, do you have access to that business panel yourself, or or were you just looking at this as like, a, oh, this looks, looks like something related? Yeah, that's that's what I was doing originally. Well, what I originally assumed is that there isn't any segmentation between and I thought that at the protocol level, from a support level. It's using the same like sale protocol. I assumed okay, it was based on like a little bit of research. Did you know about the sale protocol beforehand or no? I'm just trying to get uh, into the a into little the, bit. Yeah, yeah. The sorry, sorry. Space a little bit here. I think at the time I didn't know about that it was specifically called sale, but I realized that there's a tool set internally, and there was like a little documentation that was like scattered across like mm-hmm. GitHub or whatever, where it had like reset device, or whatever. But uh, to clarify, like I knew it was possible, and then I. I kind of thought about it and there's the customer facing website, which is very restricted and locked down. And then there's like the business website, which has, you know, if you're like a business, you can manage more stuff. You have multiple devices. It's like an easier interface, right? So that was the thought process, but I dug at the business website and uh, I eventually found an API, which let you do those sale commands and, I found the second vulnerability where there was a leaked secret, which was used to encrypt the router serial number in the pipe in the flow. Um, so I could basically decrypt and encrypt any router serial number that was passed in that protocol to do like anything. So was you this could, an unauth API, like, or it, were you authed into the business website? Full, it was a uh, fully unauthed. Yeah, it was unauthed. And you Everything just was found it in the JS files, uh, or were you brute forcing it? It was in yeah JavaScript. It was basically the flow was. Website to JavaScript to directory traversal to Swagger files to API call uh, from a traversal. So it was like a secondary context thing where you traverse to another internal routing thing. And then uh, in the JavaScript, it has the encrypt functionality. Because I saw the router value and I was like, that's like not a normal string. That's not. So I realized it's encrypted, so you could decrypt it. And then uh, through that, you could... It's absurd to think about to me because... It's if you're the FBI, you have an office building that uses this ISP for your internet, right? And if someone was to like man in the middle of your network, they'd have to like go into your network and do the whatever. But like you can just update DNS via this, via the serial number, and it's like innumerable. And it's oh, just no. we could also search by customers by name or business name. So it's like you could target like it's just Wow, dude. You That's know, like crazy. it's crazy. So, yeah. So, yeah. Go ahead, Joel. Right. Sorry. Well, and this is on your ISP. Is like you know one of the largest. I mean, they also have a monopoly where I live. Um, they're like one of two ISPs in my area. I think most people use them, and um, you know they're they're a huge, huge, massive megacorp. Do, do they even have a security contact? Like, I, I'm almost certain they don't have a bug bounty program, right? No, they had like a. They maybe had a security page, like a responsible disclosure. They did have a responsible disclosure page, but you had to like go through a couple people to actually get to somebody. Um, yeah, they didn't really seem to have like a super sophisticated, I couldn't find a security contact. Um, they maybe had a CISO, but they weren't reachable. They didn't have an email or LinkedIn that accepted the invite or anything like that. Um, wow. Yeah. No way to contact so, it. So let yeah. me just, I'm going to try to concisely do this because uh, sure. Sam, this is really something special, like what the way that you have found this whole path. Um, and it's something a little bit more foreign to me because for me, a lot of what hacking looks like is get the main application, figure out all of the functionality, figure out all of the logic, you know, find all the requests, start correlating information, deep dive the stack, you know, that sort of thing. But this whole thinking about it from an architectural level is very different. So you had a call with a support agent. The support agent said the wrong thing to Mr. Sam Curry and said, I'm going to reset your... <laughs> Sam Curry's like mental note. Very interesting. (laughs) Oh, thanks. Okay, bye. Fucking immediately start attacking. And you're thinking, okay, so they have some way to remotely reset my my router. I bet 
that it's easier to access that through the business portal than it is through the customer portal. Maybe you went to the customer portal first or whatever, and then but then you decided to go to the business portal. Go to the business portal, no auth, no nothing. That doesn't scare you off. You're just looking at the JS files. You find unauth API access that, that you can have. You path reverse it, hit the swagger. Then using the swagger, you find, I mean, I imagine the swagger did have documentation in it for all the, yeah, okay. So at that point, you're like, yep. all right, I'm good to go. Then from the swagger file, yeah. you're, are you hitting, is it a reverse proxy or is it a secondary context thing on that API or was it a secondary context thing before that to hit the swagger file? It was a secondary context to hit the swagger file and that opened the door. Everything was connected at okay. that point in the secondary and context. And then now yeah. you've got the keys to the kingdom with the swagger file and the unauthed API and you can just encrypt and decrypt IDs because of that secret. And then you can take over any any freaking router yeah. in your whole ISP. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy to think about because it's like, and, and shout out to Zayat for helping me with the JavaScript too because the encrypt function was at a certain point. So I just had a break point in the mm -hmm. JavaScript to actually call that JavaScript. Um, Zayed's the master at this. He's done like a lot of really cool research. So, but uh, if him. you're setting an encrypt, or if you're setting a breakpoint, then that JS would have to be triggering, which I imagine would only happen after auth, right? So did he have to like somehow hijack that flow and trigger that function or? So there, there was a submit registration endpoint that you could hit <laughs> and it would encrypt your pen code. So <laughs> you didn't actually get approved or anything, but you could encrypt your, uh, like, you know, 154, it would send encrypted gotcha. value. And that's so, how I found it. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. This is such a cool, a cool little, like, pocket of research, too, because I've thought a lot about this. Like, modems are such a weird spot. A lot of modems, especially, like, the provided ones, they don't give you any way to interface with them, right? Like, my modem, for example, has, like, a fiber line going into it. It's an ONT, I guess. But, and then it just outputs Ethernet to my computer you know, my, my network. Right. But how do I talk to the, the box that like gets fiber, right? Like that is, can, that's talking to the ISP that does some theoretically some negotiation or communication back with the ISP so that some random person can't just plug a fiber in and get a internet for free. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, I, you know, it's like, how, how does all that work? It's such a, such a weird, like, yeah, I, I love just like peering into that. I, I think there's a lot more int uh, interesting research you could do there. The ONT boxes too are super like proprietary. Like I had the, the guy was at my house and I was like, could I buy one of those? And he's like, nope, they got to come from the ISP. And you go to the ONT website. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't buy them yourself. Like you can maybe yeah. get them off eBay, but yeah, very proprietary. Wow, this, that would be such a fun live hacking event. If some like, you know, Verizon or Cox or whatever is just like, all right, here's your house. And they give us a little like you know yeah. router hack yeah. us you know that would be so that would be awesome. Fun. Um, I love it. Yeah. All right, dude. So that was a that was a great a great Vuln story. Thank you for getting into the technical details with that. That really helps me understand from a bigger perspective what your methodology is for finding these sort of fringe assets and going after these goals that you've got. Um, the next one that I kind of want to talk about is your next next JS research um, that you did. 2022, I think. Uh, and and I, if I understand correctly, this was a was something that came from the fact that a lot of companies are using this framework now, specifically in the crypto space, and that motivated you to look into it, right? Right, exactly. Like one big thing for me was like uh, with crypto, it, it's always been kind of crazy to me because like the huge thing for crypto is integrity, right? If you look at the CIA triad, confidentiality is like you, the only thing you need to really worry about is like leaking your keys uh being like availability it's like if it goes down it's like whatever you still have the chain access it's like a static website who cares right but the integrity is like super important right so like if i'm a normal person and i want to go to uniswap to like trade a million dollars for this or for a million dollars of that i trust uniswap.org and i'm not really going to do too much additional verification like you know, nobody's doing like hash verifications of the JavaScript or whatever they're in. Right? It's all very like MetaMask, Swap, I trust the domain name, right? So the idea for me is like, if you can get XSS on Next.js, which is what all the crypto websites use, then you have this like huge, huge integrity issue where it's like, you know, there's nonstop phishing domains. And this was the, the first case that I'd personally seen someone leverage subdomain takeover for a phishing domain. Because I saw on Twitter someone had taken over like something.ferrari.com and then hosted like an NFT giveaway or something, oh, really? right? Wow. And it's like, 
Yeah, it was really cool to see because I'm like, hey, stuff's going to take over. Like, someone's actually exploiting that for, oh, like, cool. a malicious oh, purpose, wait. right? That's not good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the, the one actual instance of it being exploited in the wild. <laughs> exactly. Like, so <laughs> that that was always fascinating to me. So, like, the next JS, like, every single website, you proxy it. You see underscore next, and you're like, oh, my God, same thing over and over and over. So, for me, it's like, let's investigate this, and maybe there's, like, a core issue because personally, like, Vercel and Netlify and all these companies, they're like great, they're great companies, but like the bloat um, associated with it. There's a really funny quote actually from like Whitey Cracker on a blog he wrote a long time ago. And he says, uh, if any one of these, like all it takes is like one of these like fringe JavaScript framework developers to die of like Adderall overdose and like a quarter of the internet goes down. Nobody can ever fix it again because like it's such a particular library. So yeah. It's like the XZ thing that, that's happening right now. Like LibXZ, we came like so close, just like grazed oh the God. sun yeah. with uh, with how that could have been. And it's the same thing, right? It's like all it takes is one really widely used library or framework or something to get popped in a fundamental way. And everybody's like, Everyone's oh, screwed. shit. <laughs> that, yeah. that affects everything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And for, for Next.js especially too, it's like, at the time, I was so focused on crypto, I was like, let's try to target all the crypto websites. So I worked with Shubs on this one, and we went deep on the source code for the actual like image proxy mm-hmm. functionality. Basically, what they've done is they've baked in this like image optimization feature where you know, maybe in the past, you've had like, an external image that has to load each time, but like instead of reaching out to the other website, it does the closer server, and it optimizes it and caches it, so you don't have to like waste the network traffic. So what that actually does is like the server itself is originally making that request to fetch the image, right? So if you loaded like, uh, I think it was underscore IPX slash external URL, it would, uh, or underscore IPX slash trusted URL, like percent two F image dot PNG. What you could actually do through investigating the source code is you could add a header to overwrite the external URL that it reaches out to, and then it would cache uh. it. And we, what we realized is that you could do, yeah, SVG files. And by doing an external SVG file and caching it on that URL, you could save like %2f test.html or test.svg, and then it would cache the XSS payload and you could send it to somebody else. And since it was at like a library level, you could do it like on any wow. website, right? And so yeah. did you get that from reading the source code for, for that? I imagine that wasn't just experimentation. No, yeah, it was a it was a bit of both. Um, mostly it was source code because like you could trace everything is public, which is kind of it's one of like those like Silicon Valley like yeah. open source, but sort of will like give you a trial so, or something. So yeah, um, I actually want to ask about this because I I think I'm being a little I I don't fully understand the whole infrastructure for this. So obviously we see a sure. lot of Next.js stuff on the on the client side, um, but is this is this you know. I'm having a little bit of trouble correlating this to to what it is. I mean, obviously they've got some server yeah. side functionality. We see a bunch of stuff with that on the client side. Is it like a full stack solution for that, or? Yeah. So Next.js is uh, it's a full stack solution, or and it's kind of like mm. a framework. It's essentially what it is is a JavaScript mm. framework, and it does both front end okay. and back end. So, and what's it's it's offered by I think Vercel. Vercel is the originally they they're the original builders maybe of of Next.js and. Vercel is like, here's Next.js, and if you really want an easy way to deploy it, just come to our website, right? So a lot of Next.js that you see is actually deployed through Vercel's okay. website through a sort of like AWS setup, okay, right? So this is a full, so, um, and, and this is very interesting. So it, it, there's there's certain trade-offs between the the server side and the, and the client side that are baked right into it, just like this image optimization thing. I see why that this this sort of put off the alarms in your head because I hadn't really looked at the structure before. But what I had seen is like um, it does make me think a little bit of this this Cloudflare stuff that I that we talked about on the pod maybe last week or a couple weeks ago um, of like these slash CDN CGI endpoint that's on literally every single <laughs> website. Um, there's got to be some weird stuff there, man. I swear. Uh, right. I, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Any, I mean, there's a lot of things that are like this, right? Like. Imagine if somebody finds an XSS oh in Google gosh. Tag Manager. Yeah. Oh my right? god! Like, yeah, right. it's like every website in the world. It's you know, yeah. I think I was hacking on like that was one of those things where it's like 
I was hacking on like some really hardened target and it was, some, it was used by everybody. It was like something similar to like Venmo or something like that. Right. And what I saw was that there was a JavaScript dependency and the source and I'd never seen that domain before. And it was like a tenant based JavaScript file. So like you could customize your JavaScript for your tenant on that third party SaaS product. And it was being added to this. So if somebody compromised oh. that, you've now added the single point of failure. It's crazy. Yeah, it's so yeah. interesting. The, the, especially on these bigger hardened programs, this is something that I've I talked a little bit um, about post a live hacking event that happened in the past year um, with, with some of the guys afterwards. It was just kind of discussing like when you've got these big targets that pay for impact that are very, very secure and locked down, Many times, the weakest link is going to be these third-party endpoints that they that they or these third-party providers that they pull in without doing too much of a security assessment on it, because you know they they may have very solid security controls from uh from just like you were talking about um, before the episode with with Donut, you know, and trying to build a an authorization framework that just makes it impossible at compile time to do an authorization issue. Um, you know, they may have uh, protocols like that in place at their organization, but when the freaking marketing team says, I need this, you know, plugin or whatever for my front end, they're not going to audit that whole source code base, you know? Um, and yeah. And they can't continuously audit it either. Right. Maybe they audit it once and then in a year or two, the, you know, they never get to see what happens and the uh, Voln gets accidentally snuck in there or, or committed by accident. And yeah, you know, such it's, a risk. Yep. It, it, it's a huge risk. And then, and then, you know, like you guys were saying as well, all of the whole internet is built on these like maintainer building, building blocks. <sighs> it's, it's depressing to see, to be honest. And it makes you wonder, uh, is it open yeah, source? Dude. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, there needs to be like some massive government grant or something like that for open source, you know, maintainers <laughs> that are just like, please continue doing the thing you're doing so that we don't lose our whole internet infrastructure. <laughs> that, yeah. would, that would be big. It really yeah, is tricky. Um, so yeah, I, I think it makes a lot of sense why you would target next JS and that, that, um, that target or that, uh, IPX piece of of how you're able to to cache that pretty rad. The other vulnerability that I was looking at in here that seemed pretty interesting to me was the open redirect via underscore next slash image. Um, and just to be clear for anybody listening to these, these vulnerabilities are long long patched. You know, if they're running, I don't know something super old and it's not hosted, then maybe you'll still find these. But um, these are long patched, so it's mostly just useful for the methodology. Um, and Having ha man having an open redirect on any website that has underscore next, you know, would be so clutch because it's so helpful to have these. And um, when you're looking for open redirects, I, I see the payload here was slash backslash slash backslash slash, right? So there's slashes in between, and essentially what's happening here or backslashes in between is it's getting normalized to a slash slash redirect right or, or a slash, yeah. slash payload and that's why it's redirecting correct do you have any other right. yeah any other also, cool tricks like that you look for when you're doing um, open redirect searching um there's so many and they're so dependent on the actual like implementation mm. uh honestly sitting there and like my tips and tricks like I don't know. See, this is, um, this is right, Sam, this is why podcasting is tricky, right? Because I, I yeah. said what I said earlier about intuition, you know, and I, I said I'm not a bunch of a, a intuitive hunter, but that's more more so from a from a top level, you know, architecture perspective. When you're trying to explain why, on a podcast why you test the things you test and, or what is your methodology, it's so hard when you don't have your hands on something. Like if you were just, if you had, right. your, if I handed you a, you know, closed redirect <clears throat> and I said, Sam, make this an open redirect, uh, you know, I'm sure you would be able to talk through the concepts of what you're doing as you're fiddling with it. But when I say, Sam, what's your methodology for open redirects? It's real tricky, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of funny, like trying to come up with like condense like the knowledge into like a, a you know, a sense or whatever. So be a podcast thing that's like informative. Um, I totally agree. Like searching for this in particular was fun because like the goal for me was like, well, it essentially was allowing local images like explicitly. So like, for instance, if you wanted to proxy underscore next slash IMG question mark image equals slash image dot PNG. Totally fine. Loves it. Says, well, we're going to try to find an image. And if we can, we're going to proxy it for you and serve it. Right. And for me, that's kind of interesting because it's like, 
well, I know that slash slash will route to an internal, dom- like a, uh, yeah, external domain. TLT, and, uh, yeah. Or like a fully yeah. qualified domain name. Yeah, so I was trying to play with that for a while. And then what I realized is that I was like, well, it doesn't like uh, two slashes in a row. So like I could do like forward slash backslash and then to make it finish, you could do forward slash backslash again. And then you've got the FQDN, mm-hmm. right? And then uh, what I realized after that too was that I think if you ended the URL in a path that was not completed or if I look back through it really mm-hmm. quick... Um, yeah, if you if you ended it in a slash, so Next.js has this behavior which is really funny. The reason this vulnerability exists is because uh, in Next.js, if you hit and a full if if you if you hit a path and the path doesn't exist, that ends in a slash. For instance, if you hit slash test slash, and that's not a real thing, what it tries to do is take you back to slash test to mm-hmm. see if it's a real thing I've without the before. slash. Yeah. So what's cool about that though is that at the time of reporting it. The, the underscore next uh, slash IMG would actually send an HTTP request to itself. And then you could abuse that functionality because it would return the redirect to the user. So then basically you would get uh, open redirect for any site because it would try to send that request to itself and then it would serve the response that it got from itself, which had the forward slash backslash forward slash backslash attacker.com. Wow, so it was, it was creating, you were sort of creating a loop of sorts there. Exactly. Very cool, dude. Yeah, it's it it's tricky to explain all of those different uh, open redirect pieces, but one thing that's consistent with that is like you have to have a very solid understanding of browser redirect mechanics and URLs and how URLs are parsed in order to find all these, and then you just got to try to figure out the places where oh the developer didn't consider the you know double slash uh, being a a, a, a top level you know <laughs> redirect um, versus in a a, um, a relative so an absolute redirect versus a relative redirect. Um, and so, yeah, no, uh, I really, I really like this one. And man, I wish this still existed because what a gadget, what a gadget <laughs> that would be, man, on so many websites. Yeah. And that's interesting. Specific. Yeah. And, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask, like, did you approach it at all from like the static analysis or like the, just because you have like the JS right in front of you. So it's, but it was it just easier to test it sort of black box than it was to dig through a bunch of JavaScript code and figure out how that works. Yeah, luckily for me, I'm I'm a very non source code person. I'll do fine with source code, and I enjoy it, and I appreciate it. But for me, uh, I like to just test the actual functionality versus trying to dig into the code. Because one thing that my philosophy a little bit is, when the developers wrote that code, they wrote what they intended it and wanted it to do. And even though if you know the tricks around it, sometimes you'll trick yourself into thinking that something's working intended. And if you take the approach of like an external person who's like, well. I don't think it's working as intended. We'll try to figure it out. Then sometimes you can get better results. But it's cool to work with Shubs because Shubs is a fantastic like source code auditor. So we kind of merged a little bit where I was like smashing the keyboard and he's like analyzing stuff in the source. And you can you can awesome. you know, yeah, bounce awesome. off of each other too. Where you say, "Hey, I'm seeing something weird at dynamic analysis." go figure out why that's happening. And then, you know, they go figure out why that's happening and it leads you to a clearer picture of like, "Okay, that's why that's happening, and you can exploit it further because you now have introspection into the code surrounding the fringe weird functionality. I, I like right, that. Yeah. I like that. All right, man. We are two hours and twenty minutes in right now, so um, let's oh, wow. let's go ahead and and wrap up. The last thing that I, I wanted to talk about here was you mentioned before that you have um, a lot of success with dev versus prod. Um, in, in the context of JWTs being used as a form of of, um, of authentication, can you talk a little bit about that? And maybe I don't know if you have a story about it, but you can feel free to share a story if you do. Yeah, sure. So uh, the dev versus prod thing is really fun because uh, if you're a developer and you're writing like a Next.js application and you have like you know, if I'm a startup and I start a company and I use Next.js and I do all the things correctly, but let's say I accidentally reuse the same key and I store it in my source code, and then I deploy a dev site and a prod site, and I'm provisioning user IDs for each registered user. If I register in dev, I'll be user ID 3 or whatever, but in prod, I'm like user ID 463. But a lot of times what I could do is just copy over the dev JWT to prod, and then I could access account number 3. And then, like, some funny stories, too, with that... Um, 
it, it's just kind of part of my attack methodology now for like next JS websites because it's just one of those things I saw like a few times. Yeah, I think specifically for Next.js, because uh, honestly, with Next.js, it's getting a lot harder to test for bugs, I feel like, because, like, you've got everything in the JavaScript, and, like, I don't know, it, it, it's all there, but, like, it just gets boring. It's the same thing over and over again. So it's just not, like, entertaining to hack on. So I kind of, I've been trying to do this for uh, Next.js websites because I know it's a common thing I've seen. Um, but, yeah, copying the staging... JBT to prod and then seeing if there's an indifference for which and, account you get if the secret you find is the same. There's normally one piece of information they're basing uh, their auth off, off of there, like like an ID versus like an email or anything like that. Yeah, a lot of times, a lot of times it's ID, but other times it's email. The ID ones are sometimes harder to exploit because it's like UID based, and then you can't really do anything unless you can control it. But the ones that are fun are the email ones that don't like require confirmation. Mm-hmm. Um, because say you register like admin at company.com and like you do on one and the other and the other one's not registered, then yeah, you generate you it. just target whatever access. account um, you want and then just opt into it. That's exactly, cool, yeah. Though. And those, it's, yeah, it's been a Vuln for a long time or like kind of a Vuln class, but I've seen it kind of pop back up a tiny bit. With I think, think Irby, Irby also mentioned that this is a part of his function or normal methodology for this sort of thing. And I know he's popped some cool bugs with that in the past. Um, so there's definitely, there's definitely bugs to be found in that, in that, uh, area. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering as well, what your, what your recon looks like then, because you do have this whole thing where you're like, <clears throat> where you're going deep for sure, but you're also finding the fringe assets you need to find to get the impact. So to what degree do you spend time on, on recon versus focusing on hacking the applications you've discovered? Yeah. So recon, like. I love recon for getting an understanding and feel of the app. For instance, finding like, you know, dev.ant.company.com versus prod or, and like kind of understanding the infrastructure. Um, I'm not a really big fringe asset hunter. So I'm not really somebody who goes at like, you know, some crazy subdomain that popped up for four seconds on cert.sh, right? Like I can't do that. It's not my style. Um, but what I'll do is I'll use recon data to kind of get an understanding, like whether or not there's Akamai hosts for everything. And one of them is a non-Akamai host and I can change the host header and do, you know, like that's how you get an info. But um, what I'll do for targeting assets is like try to pull together an understanding. Like maybe there's a domain that has like a swagger file. Maybe there's a domain that has this. And then I'll try to use it to attack whatever has the most functionality, whether that's dub, 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 my account dot, app dot, Mostly those core ones I try to stick to. Dude, that's yeah. one of the most balanced approaches I've I've heard of. It takes it on the pod is like, use recon data to the extent that it gives you a picture of the organization and to explain the full architecture of the organization. And then from there, you attack the thing that has the most features and the most attractive features as well. Very, right. very Yeah, cool. I love that because it's, yeah. There's another, yeah, there's a hacker... Uh, Cash money, Tanner. Tanner. He uh, he has a similar attacking style, like Jack Cable, mm. maybe even Irby, but they're all like swear to the fact they're like manual hackers who they'll employ stuff, like they'll script stuff, definitely. Like I've seen Tanner script like crazy stuff and he's done really well. But like mostly they seem like they're manual testers where it's like, it's like why wouldn't you go after the part of the app with the most functionality? Like if I could, some random asset's going to have two API calls that are like integers and not, Versus the main app is like six years of like 400 developers rotating in and out of being fired yeah. and new ones and like, you know what I mean? hundred percent, dude. Wow. That's a, that's a great way to wrap off this pod is, is that, that really balanced approach to recon and in looking at an organization holistically rather than an individual web app. Um, that's, that's definitely something for me to chew on. Joel, did you have anything else you wanted to toss out there before we bounce? Um, no, I mean, I'll, I'll open it up to Sam. Cause, um, you know, I know we've talked about a bunch of different things, but uh, you know, obviously hack compute and some of the other stuff you're working on your blog, um, <laughs> Sam just, Curry. You know, where can people find you and, uh, yeah. and, w- and watch out for more of your awesome research? Yeah. Uh, I think Sam Curry.net and then, uh, hack compute.com. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to continue to publish like cool web stuff to samcreate.net, but I haven't done too. I, I've been doing a lot more, so I'm kind of happy to be able to publish some more stuff. But uh, besides that, like hackcompute.com, I want to publish more AppSec stuff. 
Um, but yeah, mostly thank you to Justin and Joel for putting this together. Like, I don't know if to the listener, like behind the scenes is so much effort. Like there's a full Google doc of like 10 hours of like writing out, like, and then researching and figuring stuff out. Yeah. So it's total honor. Um, really, really appreciate them. So well, that's thanks, it. thanks for coming on, Sam. We'd love to have you on and uh, we'll awesome. definitely have you back on in the future to share some of this cool research that's coming off at, uh, at samcurry.net. So, all right. That's the pod. <laughs> Cheers. Peace. Peace. Peace.